it's obviously to state the obvious, we're gathered because of Shnas Hakel, and the Rebbe asked that during this year we get together multiple times in order to increase our Yiddish Shemayim. I don't think there's a better way for us to increase our Yiddish Shemayim by finding a new way and a new angle to kach in the Rebbe's Torah and the Rebbe's Sichis, and for that we have our man, the right man, Rabbi Simon Jacobson, with us here this evening. And we're going to do this as an interview style, which means we're going to ask questions. First, I'm going to ask the questions. He's going to give the answers. And then toward the end, we'll open it up to questions from the floor. Just going to give a brief hakdama, generally about Sichis. It's important to realize that if you ask the question, where did Sichis come from? In other words, we had many, there are seven Rabbeim. We have no Sichis of the Alter Rebbe. We have no Sichis of the Tzamach Tzadik. We don't have Sichis of the Rebbe Marash either. And that's because... The Torah that the, the first Rabbeim said was all my Marim. They were called Drushim and my Marim. These were deep in Yonim and Chesidus that they said. And for the most part, this is the way it worked. That was the Seder of the earlier Rabbeim. So that's why if you go to Kahas and you want to buy the Lakut HaSichis of the Alter Rebbe from the Middle Rebbe, the Tzamech Tzedek, the Rebbe Marash, you're, you're not going to find it. It doesn't exist. The real Sichis began with, with that were open to the public is that the Rebbe Rashab had Fabrengins and they were open to the public and people came. However, the Rebbe Rashab didn't write this. It was written by other people, and that's the Sefer Teir Shalom that we have. The Sikh is up, but it was only three times a year, Purim, Yutas Kislev, and Simchas Torah. Pretty much, that's the whole Teir Shalom. It's three Fabrengans a year from the Nesiyas of the Rebbe Rashab. The Fidik Rebbe started saying Sikh is Bishufi, a lot of Sikh Some of the Sikh he wrote down himself. Some of the Sikh other people wrote down, the Hanochis of the Sikh and some, the Fidik Rebbe was Magia and reviewed those types of Sikh. So you have a range. When the Rebbe assumed the leadership in Toshin Yod Aleph, it became very clear at the beginning that the Rebbe is not going to be writing the Sichis. There's going to be Sichis and Maimar, both the Sichis and Maimar, and the Rebbe is not going to be writing. And that's why this whole Moisid began from the very beginning of the people who were involved in writing both the Sichis and the Maimar. Sometimes the Rebbe reviewed him was Magia, sometimes not. And uh, Rabbi Jacobson was an integral part of this Moisid for many years, as we're going to be hearing about. So uh, that's my general hakdama. Rabbi Jacobson, do you want to say something before uh, we begin? I don't want to, um, you know, override the the chief rabbi here, <coughs> Marda Asda, but if I may uh, correct a few points, um, <laughs> a few things. First of all, the very concept of Teir Shabal Peh is sichus, basically. Everything delivered orally, even from Moshe Rabbeinu. And we know Tere B'Pirusha Nitna. So the true first Chazrim and the first people who remembered things were uh, all your ancestors, all our ancestors, going back to Mount Har Sinai. So maybe they didn't call it Sichus at the time, but they, def- they were definitely part of conversations and discussions and dialogues that were delivered orally. And then Rabbein HaKadosh uh, codified it and turned it into the Mishnah, which later became Mishnah, Gemara. So, the same as with the, the, the Rabbeim, the Rabbi Sein Nisienu, the Baal Shem Tov spoke mostly Baal Peh. He didn't write almost anything. There were very few things. And what he said was short titles, but they, again, they didn't call them Sichas, they called them uh, Imres. I mean, you can call it all kinds of things, but technically he was speaking and his uh, chassidim wrote it down. They were the manichim, the chesrim. Same thing with the magid. It was the Alter Rebbe, actually, that was the first, really, author. He authored Tanya and Shulchan Aruch. All the rest of the Alter Rebbe's uh, teira came by Peh, meaning the maimorim that we know, teira er, lukut teira, all the maimorim of the Alter Rebbe were said orally, and those were manichim, chesrim and manichim, which are, just to give a little background there, that a chazer is someone that remembers almost verbatim what was said, and a maniach is someone who commits it to paper. Not every chazer is a maniach, not every maniach is a chazer. It's a particularly very different skill set. But the Alter Rebbe had uh, essentially, uh, just for a little uh, background, he had actually at a certain time five different manichim. The Mitla Rebbe, uh, the son of the Alter Rebbe, the, the Ramosha, the son of the Alter Rebbe, his brother, the Maril, Rabbi Huda Leib, the Rapinchis Rezes, that's why you have Hanochis called Rapinchis Rezes, and Tzemach Tzedek when he was a little older, and not all the Mamorim. So actually there are times where we have five versions of the same Maimir of the Alter Rebbe, and they're quite different. They're not different in the, the actual substance, but in style and so on. 
It was the Mittler Rebbe that almost wrote everything. And the Mittler Rebbe was a real author and a publisher, not going into all the details. He also, things were also, there were also Chayzer Manichim, but most of his Torah was written. Same thing, Samach Tzedek, Rebbe Marash, and the Rebbe Rashab, and the Friedrich Rebbe, they all wrote most of their Torahs. There are Sikhs, there is a Sefer HaSikhs actually of the Samach Tzedek, because Sikhs that would mean that the Samach Tzedek spoke at a meal, or he spoke... Uh, to a few people, but it's correct. I'm not uh, completely disagreeing with what you said. I'm saying the other Rebbe turned it, of course, into a whole different world where most of his Torah was not Maimorim. Remember, all the Rabbeim, their Torah was primarily formal Maimorim Chassidus, what's called Dach, Divrei Likim Chaim, which, as I said, they wrote. I mean, they're not everything they wrote, but most of it they wrote themselves. The Rebbe, like the Alter Rebbe in a way, almost didn't write anything. The Rebbe has some things in writing. We have Rishimus, we have published works, Truva Sibirium, Igres, of course, letters. But the bulk of the Rebbe's Teda was delivered orally. And we didn't know in Tav Yud, I mean, I wasn't around in the beginning, but they didn't know how much the Rebbe would fabreng. But then it became apparent that his main kayach was Bedibur. And the Rebbe, though he wrote much less, but his speaking and the volumes of all his talks are far more than all the Rabbeim sometimes maybe even put together. Not to say, suggest that Rabbeim produced plenty. I mean, today we have the library. library. Every one of the Rabbeim has at least 40, 50s for him, if not more in, in some cases. But the Rebbe was the bulk was Tibur, and therefore it became so much dependent on the Hanochis uh, or the Chazim and the Manichim even more than the other Rabbeim. So just, uh, I'm just adding a few nuances here. As far as a, just a general introduction before we get into anything, is what can I say? Um, you know, this is my claim to fame. You know, when I come up to Lamaila, this will be the thing that I will use as my ticket in um, because I wasn't doing my own work. I was doing the work of trying to faithfully document and for posterity what the Rebbe said. Uh, we all make our mistakes, but we tried our best. And this was uh, many ways what shaped my life. So back when I'm back from a being a Bach, and I'm sure you'll have some questions about this, so I'm not going to go into the history right now, but I just want to say on a personal and, uh, and a personal and emotional note that uh, my years when I was uh, struggling as a struggling young adult teenager with my own uh, issues and uh, my skepticism and my own questions, so many ways really my getting involved in the Sikhs was somewhat for myself also a personal journey of... Um, having access to the top. I wanted access, you know, if you're going to have access, you might as well go to the top. And who's the top? The Rebbe himself. And working in the Sikhs gave the opportunity to write to the Rebbe and ask questions. You had an open door. Nothing was, uh, you never had any limits. I could write 100 times a day and would always get an answer, almost 90, almost every time. Because it wasn't personal, it was also for the public benefit. And I can tell you, I exploited the opportunity to the fullest. Which meant, you know, when you have such access, wherever I had an opportunity to ask a question, especially sensitive questions like about things that we all wonder about, good and evil and pain and suffering and the Holocaust and, you know, all the big questions. So wherever I was able to smuggle it in, I did it. And, uh, and we got answers. And sometimes we got over our head as well. Don't worry, the Rebbe did not mince words. He knew how to be quite brutal um, in a healthy, loving way, of course. So it shaped my life, let's put it this way. I'm not who I am today is completely defined by what happened those years. You know, I'll, we'll go into more details, but I wanted to just say it. So for me, it's a personal type of uh, almost a debt that I repay as much as I can to share of what I experienced because it's so, it was so uh, critical in the, who I am today as a person and everything that I've done. It shaped my mind, it shaped my way of thinking. I mean, I can't even know what I would have been like had I not done this work. Because remember, it's hours and hours of sitting and absorbing not your own ideas, someone else's ideas. Try it out. It's not so simple. And, uh, and trying to almost assimilate, almost like, you know, if you almost put yourself aside, and how are you going to channel a higher wisdom that's not your own? And then you're subject to present it to the Rebbe who knows what he said, and you have to be the one now, be subject to, are, are you, did you... Uh, were you machaven? Did you uh, align it? And we tried our best, uh, as I'm sure we'll share. There are plenty of humorous moments and plenty of harsh moments, but they were all, in my opinion, uh, love. It was uh, not easy job, not easy to remember six hours of a fabrengen, almost verbatim. 
people think it's almost impossible to even imagine how could you do that. But I'm sure you'll ask me some of those tricks, and I'll give you some trade secrets. Not all, and I still have to maintain um, certain uh, NDA. I mean, we can sign, right, the non-disclosure. Uh, um, frankly, no, there really are really no secrets, because if you know how to do it, you know how to do it. And if I tell you, that necessarily means you can do it. There are, <laughs> there are methods. Um, so we'll talk about it then. As I said, to me it was, a, it was a life transforming. It was far more than just writing Fabrengans on paper and moving on. It, uh, wish, I wish it upon all of you to be able to have that opportunity to be able to have the bittle, to be able to put yourself aside and channel, as I said, and, and uh, bring down to, onto paper and, and to communicate to others ideas that are not your own but come from a greater and higher place. So thank you for having me, and thank you for the opportunity to share some of the events that happened, the history, and uh, whatever you want to cover. And uh, there's no questions. I always say nothing is taboo, nothing is off limits. You could ask anything you like. I'm an adult. If I don't want to answer, I won't. But, uh, but you should ask anything you want. You don't have to hesitate, even if it's provocative or controversial or challenging. And with that, uh, thank you again. All right, so let's go. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, when was that moment when you tell yourself, hey, there's this, I can do that. There's this concept of Chazara, and why not me? When was that moment? Well, let me give you just a, a moment before the moment. How about that? That's always more important to know. You have to be ready for the moment. Um, so I was, as I mentioned, I was, uh, to put it quite uh, candidly, though I, you know, I was born in 1956, you want to calculate my age, you can if you like. I always give people like 10 seconds if you like. <laughs> they like to do that, you know. Um, so I'm a, one of the baby boomers. You know, before Generation X and Y and Z and whatever the generations, I'm not even sure. Um, so as a teenager, I went through the whole system. I grew up here in Crown Heights. I went to the Lubavitcher Chabad school system. I'm not going to go into all the nightmares and the... Uh, yeah, full disclosure, I wasn't molested and I wasn't abused. Let's just get that out of the way. So I don't have any real grievances and uh, trauma and all the words that everybody uses today and the pains. But at the same time, I was very, a very skeptical person and I wasn't very inspired in yeshiva, to be very honest. It was what we would call today, and maybe I didn't have that word then, mediocre. You know, a lot of good memories, good people around me and a nice family. So it's not like, again, I didn't grow up in around abuse and dysfunctionality as later I came to discover exists. But nevertheless, on an intellectual and a, a spiritual level, I guess, I wasn't inspired at all. And I would always wonder whether this whole, um, this whole system isn't just some type of mind control program to keep people in line. I saw the value in it, you know. Uh, I know that Pesach Seder, Shabbos, Yom Tov, you know, it's not like I didn't see the warmth and the family and community power. But uh, but still, and as a level, you know, this absolute truth, mm -hmm. and so on. And though the Rebbe was a figure in my life, obviously growing up here, he was like, but he was like a king on the hill. I didn't have any personal connection, in a real personal way. It was yeah, the Rebbe. I had no reason not to respect him. I I didn't identify with him, and uh, so I had to. I struggled internally because you couldn't really talk about these things. You'd be blacklisted. That I was wise enough to know. You know, um, I was the guy that never got expelled, but my friend always got expelled, you know. So I was like the troublemaker, like the guy that speeds right behind a guy that speeds a little more than you, you know, so that if he's going to get stopped. So I, uh, I I didn't cross any real serious lines in behavior, but intellectually I crossed many lines, which means I read a lot, not of Jewish sources, let's put it this way. I was very curious, and I was a, a ravenous uh, reader, and... Um, um, and I really just was looking for for truth, to be honest. I really had no other agenda. And it was in that time period that I began to, um, uh, you know, Chassidus didn't speak to me yet. It was just words. It was like a guy told me the other day, Chassidus, yeah, Lamates Malachis and Esses Firis, you know, like all in one uh, <laughs> sentence. Like it's a, you know, a numbers game, 39 here, 10 here, four worlds, planets, whatever they're called. But then there were different, and again, I don't want to go into detail because it's not so relevant, but to answer your question, so I think it's vital to understand where I was, my mindset. I was desperately seeking something passionate in my life. 
I've, I've, uh, today I would we'd call it a rebel without a cause. I had that rebellious energy, very strong energy, but I had nowhere to direct it. I liked physics and mathematics, but I didn't see myself becoming a passionate physicist, to be very honest. Um, and uh, it was that time when I was really seeking and I was asking questions and I was exploring is when I first began to, um, I remember it was in camp, summer camp in the year 1974. And I remember uh, one of the counselors who thought he was a big chacham. So I he used to talk to me, trying to be makar of me, you know. So uh, so I said to him, how do you know there's a God? You know, I just wanted to hear how he answers. Um, so he said to me, well, the world is a finite world. And you know that finite objects can never lead up to infinity. As much as you go with the finite, you'll never touch the infinite which is a rule in mathematics. Anyone who knows math knows that. And therefore, you have to say the world therefore has a beginning because a finite world can go endlessly. It has to have a beginning. So, you know, he didn't even realize that it touched my mathematical, uh, you know, uh, nerve. So I said to him, Where did you, how do you know that? Where does that say? So he opened up a derech mitzvah which was in the shul, maybe the only safer they had. Um, and... Uh, and he shows it to me in the Hamanus Alakus of the Tzemach Tzedek. So this was the first time that I was like intrigued. I saw, wow, that's actually written in a safe. It wasn't just some type of, you know, uh, modern uh, psychobabble or something. And it, uh, I can't say it's the only thing, but it's a series of events that intrigued me, that there's talk about the infinite, about the finite. And it was at that time when I uh, came back from the summer when I had to make decisions where I'm going to go, and I went to Morristown that year. And it was then I started listening to the Rebbe in a different way. And I started hearing between the lines this talk about the infinite, about eternity, about uh, things that are temporary and things that are permanent. And that was, I think, one of the things that clicked in me. That one second here, it's all dressed up in the levushim and garments of Parshas Ashavua and Apikayovis and Azayar and Rambam. I mean, I wasn't speaking Rambam really then, but other uh, Torah. But within it was really the essence of what life is really about. And that was the thing that most intrigued me. And then, of course, since I was so intrigued, and as I said, I'm, a, I'm an extremist, you know, like an anarchist. You're either it's all puzzle or it's all kosher. Like, you know, I wanted something all the way. So I said, let me go for this. Let me really plunge into this and what was the best way to do it is to be involved in the process of uh, producing these uh, talks so I started hanging around with Chazara every Mitzray Shabbos in Morristown they wanted to do Chazara on Sunday so I became the person to start doing it and I, and I firstly I think because I was passionate about it that made me better at it because I cared I didn't just do it because uh, out of Kabbalah sale or just to be Yetzir and as I was doing it, I became better, and I was I became aware. I became a parent, became apparent to me that I'm capable. I can't say I was a master. I was just a kid at the time. I was what it was I 17, 18, and um, and the Marston people felt that I was really doing a good job. And it's not like I, I you know, at that age you don't even think of it in terms of ego or. You know, to me, it was just like really intriguing. And then I would hang around, Abiel with Chazer, he had a small few chazim around him, Rabbi Yossi Hecht, later then I became the rabbi in Eilat, Shliach there, and some, other, and some others. So at the time I would just listen, and, uh, and but then once in a while I'd pipe in and, and say something and add something. As you know, nothing, none of this was formal. And as I became more involved, I, I was really contributing, and as I was contributing, I was welcomed into this inner group. But again, nothing was official. No one like said, here, you sign up to become a chazer. There was no such thing. Even Rabbi Yale, I mean, even though the Rebbe did uh, support what he did, but he had to want to do it. He did it. And therefore, that's how you be, you know. And there's certain jobs in Chabad that come simply because you do it, not because someone appoints you. And sometimes if you're appointed, it doesn't necessarily mean you're competent. I'm not, just, uh, that's an aside. I had to get that in. Um, and on the other hand, if you're good at something, you'll uh, rise to the occasion. And that's what happened. So we're talking now in the years 1976, 77, when I really began. Then I came to 770 in 1976, mid 76, and then I got more involved with uh, that was Havala Nochsat Mimim was beginning to um, have a new a new team, and um, 
So I was involved both in the Chazara part, and then I used to also, as they would write it, I would be one of the people they showed it to, and I would look it over and give my edits and so on and, and comments. And I just, uh, you know, I look at it more like, uh, I guess I it was an intern. Not that anyone was a professional. You know, we were all really interns. And Rabiel was the senior. He wasn't really writing Fabrengens at the time. He was looking over. He was Chazara. Um, but um, we, me and myself and the few Bochum that were around then, I could tell you who they are if you're interested. But I'll leave that up to follow up. So that was my early, early dabbling in it. And as I got better at it, obviously, it became obvious that not many could do it. So it wasn't like there was a lot of competition, to be very honest. Either you could do it or you can't do it. And then in 1978, after the Rebbe had the heart attack, 77, that's when I really became very seriously involved because Rabiel then took a liking to me. You know, I was his, like, uh, I guess, uh, whatever, bocher. He had always had these bocher. And, uh, and I would sit with him because the Rebbe wanted to be Magia, edit all the sikhs that he spoke, Mitzoy Simchus Teirem, Mitzoy Shabbos Bereshis, all those Saturday nights where the Rebbe was not speaking, was speaking from his room by, with a mic, which was a whole parsha of its own, not going into the details. So then the Rebbe edited them all for quite a few weeks. So I was working with Rabbi El. That's when I really, I guess, got the real experience of writing and footnotes and research. And we would sit up all night Rabiel was the writer, but I was his assistant, so to speak, whatever that means. Um, I could tell you, just as a humorous anecdote, may I? I don't, I don't know, you know, mm-hmm. there's no script here. So I remember we used to sit, uh, and he wouldn't want to begin working without me. Trust me, he didn't really need me. But he needed someone, you need a sidekick, you know. Um, uh, I, I was there, I'd make a safer, this, he wanted to discuss a point. So I was available, I was there. So I remember one night, it's like 4 o'clock in the morning, Mitzray Shabbos, I forgot which Mitzray Shabbos, maybe Noyach or Lech Lecha. And he turns to me, he says, Rab Simen, I'll say exactly how he told it to me, he says, Vils tana teva for Klal Yisrael. You want to do a favor for Klal Yisrael? So I thought, what do you, what do you, I said, for a cigarette and a coffee? What, you know, like, I thought <laughs> that he wants cigarettes or a coffee. That, you know, so it was like, so, I, so he says, Nay, Len is ganz lukut to teire balpeh. That's what he tells me. I shall learn the whole of the Teda Balpa. So I said to him, right now, tonight? He said, no, so you need more than a night for that, uh, <laughs> uh, even if you're a chayz. <laughs> um, so I said, why? What's, uh, why is this such a Teda for Klal Yisrael? He says, because everything is in the Teda. If you knew it, Balpa, we wouldn't have to be spending looking up this modern welcome, this. Everything is there, and I would just ask you, and you'd know. <laughs> so I told him, when do you need me to get back to you by this, about this uh, so-called offer, <laughs> suggestion? Anyway, this, uh, Rabiel had a good sense of humor. Um, uh, obviously, I didn't end up learning it, even though my grandfather, I was told, my great-grandfather, Rabbi Achmiel Chodesh, did know the whole Likud Tadeh Rabal Peh, so maybe Rabiel thought I can like, uh, reincarnate, channel him or something. But I didn't end up doing that, and, and Rabiel was right. I could say that is if you know it, Balpe, but knowing it, Balpe, is not small. So if any of you like have nothing to do with yourself, and you want to do a cl- table for Claudia, so you can take on this project if you like. That I remember. Anyway, bottom line is, I worked then, and the Rebbe edited the Sikhs, so it was the first time I was also very immersed in the Rebbe's edits. And I can't tell you the, I don't know what word to use. I don't want to use the word ecstasy, because some people may confuse it with something else. But it was an unbelievable high to uh, experience preparing something for the Rebbe and then seeing the Rebbe's edits. Because he literally took your words and he would edit it and correct it and erase and add and so on. Especially those sikhs which were very emotionally charged because this was right after the Rebbe's heart attack, remember. I remember right after the Rebbe spoke that with Soi Yom Tev Simchostera, that was no one knew the Rebbe was going to fabreng or speak. He spoke from his room around 20 minutes. And then he edited it. And the edits, the Rebbe usually edited with pencil. Then he edited with a pen. And you could see his hand was weaker than usual, especially if you knew the Rebbe's handwriting. But he edited some very profound in Yonim Chsidis, which to us was like unbelievable, that the Rebbe was like under this whole duress and all the challenges the Rebbe was facing, Begashmias. But you see the Giluim and Chsidis that were coming out then was very obvious to us. Remember, the Rebbe wrote a whole, t- other than a muskel, muskel, from Tanya. It was very, very fascinating. So that was my very early uh, formative years, I guess. Um, I know that uh, you're probably going to ask me when I, just to give you the history, in, in the end of 1979 um, is when I became the official writer. Till then, I was a chayzer, 
but official writer, Rabbi David Feldman, who was the writer before me of the Hanochas in Yiddish, um, there was no Hebrew Hanochas yet then. Um, he went to Eilat on Shlichus in, uh, before Hanukkah Tov Shin Mem, which was basically December 79, and I took over his position. And from then on, that was my, that, then I became the main writer of the Fabrengans, which was the additional title of Maniach, not just Chazer, which was a whole other responsibility, very different than remembering is one part. Writing, frankly, is even harder. But we'll get him toward, sure into that. So that somewhat gives you a little... Okay, so Not all my answers will be so long. I just thought... <laughs> I, I know I'm trying to bring history into you know, sure. background, so it's sure. not just... Uh, so if I'm short. looking for Rabbi Simon Jacobson's first Hanukha, first written piece, that will be found in Sichas Kedesh Tav Shem Mem? The war first one really is a Sicha that the Rebbe spoke to the children um, right before Purim Lamates. Um, so Dov Feldman, as I mentioned, was out of town. I think he went to Israel for a family simcha or something. So I wrote, that was the first one I actually wrote from beginning to end. And the Rebbe was Magia that. But the first one that I wrote that became, after that, that was it, meaning for me, till the Rebbe stroke in Tav Shinun Beis, so we're talking now a good 12 years, was Shabbos Parshas Miketz, Shabbos Chanukah Tav Shin Mem. And again, just to give background, remember the Rebbe was speaking because of the doctors wanted him to speak Motsai Shabbos, not Shabbos, because it was less exertion because he could speak with a mic. The Rebbe was very clearly unhappy about it, and whenever he had an opportunity, he would smuggle in a Fabreng and Shabbos. <coughs> like for example, I remember a Tav Shin Lamed Tess, Shavuos was um, Sunday and Monday, so it couldn't be a Motsai Shabbos Fabreng, because there was no mic, it was Yom Tov already. So Shabbos Bamidbar, there was a Fabreng by day. Achim Shapesach that year. Whenever the Rebbe could make a Fabreng without a mic, he, he clearly wanted to go back to that. So the last Fabreng with a with Tzoy Shabbos, I believe, was Shmois Tov Shin Mem. And uh, that was it. After that, it became Shabbosim. And a few weeks later, was um, Shmois Tov Shin Mem. So I had already began in Miketz Tov Shin Mem. But literally, when I began, I remember Rabbi El said to me, maybe it's in your schools that the Rebbe started Fabreng and Shabbos again, meaning only Shabbos. After that, the Rebbe never went back to Tzoy Shabbos. So Miketz Chanukah Tov Shemem. Don't you want to know my experience that night? Don't ask. It was a nightmare of a night. The first Hanukkah that I had to write from beginning to end. So maybe share what happened that night. <laughs> See, we worked well, well together. <laughs> that was a setup. <clears throat> so I remember, okay, so we had Chazal. It was a very difficult Fabrengen. I remember saying to myself, that's like a real Kabbalist pun him here. I'm telling you, it was um, um, extremely very deep and complex for bringing. Just to give you the taste of it, if you go to Mekate's Tov Shemem, it's one of the unknown gems. I mean, every Fabring is a gem, but that one was unique. The Rebbe made a seum then, on Mishnayis, on Shas, on Tanya, on Shulchan Aruch. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. He, he connected it all, and everything connected to Pasha Mekate's. It was extremely complicated for bringing. Koyach and Peil was a big theme. I remember Klal Prat Klal. Everything was Klal Prat Klal. You got to check out. It's an interesting sikhir. Um So, okay, so Chazorah ends, which was Matsoy Shabbos. Chazorah would take place in 770, downstairs usually, in those years. Earlier it was upstairs. Um, and there was, uh, like, like, you know, it was winter it was winter already, so it must have been not late, maybe 8, 9 o'clock Chazorah would begin. It would end uh, an hour or two later, and now starts the hard job. So Chazorah, we'd write down notes Chazorah, everybody would pipe in Rabbi Yehud, we'd usually Chazor. Sometimes someone else would. Very often he would turn to me to Chazor. And someone wrote notes of the Chazor just to get the points, just, uh, you know, like bu bullet points. The flow. And people would uh, weigh in. It was an open forum. If you were there and you once said, I remember something, you'd say it. And someone would say, no, that was later. Or it was earlier. And uh, sometimes an argument would break out. I mean, uh, all in good spirit of like, where the Rebbe said it, what did he mean? But there was no real discussion of Havana. It wasn't about understanding. It was trying to just get, let's get everything out, so to speak. You know, because this was the first opportunity to write down what the Rebbe spoke about. You know, we'll talk later about the actual process. So after Chazara, I went, in with, uh, I went, uh, I remember I went home. I decided I'll work from home. It was quieter. I had a little blue typewriter. You know what a typewriter is? No, seriously, they don't have typewriters today. A typewriter. Um, a real typewriter, there was no word processes, there were no computers, everything was on paper, 
And if you typed a page and you didn't like it, there's no uh, like going back and manipulating it. You take the paper out of the typewriter, you roll it up in a ball. It's called throwing it into the garbage can. You start again, another draft, another draft. And if you wanted to, you know, there was white out and there was cutting. I mean, it was uh, very primitive. So I remember I'm sitting my Tzoy Shabbos now. It's around 11 o'clock at night. And I'm starting to make heads or tails. And it's the first time I have to write a Fabrain completely from memory. Fabrain that I wrote that I mentioned before was from a tape, which had its own challenges. But there at least you're working with something that is really something has a, is on paper. Here I'm writing completely from memory. Chazara notes is just notes. And I cannot tell you what happened. I mean, I started typing the first page. And again, the second, again, didn't come out. I didn't know what I was writing. Next, I did it again. I probably wrote 30 drafts of the first page. There were two garbage cans filled already in my living room. And um, I remember around 4 a.m., I mamish started to uh, panic. I really, I said to myself, maybe I'm not capable. It's just not happening. As much as I was, I couldn't get out the first page. And I knew this was going to be at least 70 pages because we knew from the Rebbe's rate of speaking, every hour of the Rebbe's speaking yielded around 20 pages, double spaced eight and a half by 11. So let's say five hour for bringing is 100 pages. This was a three and a half hour for bringing. I don't remember exactly. So I knew 70, 80 pages is minimum. And I couldn't even get one page out. I remember it's around 4 a.m. I'm sitting there, you know, didn't know what I'm going to do. You know, I was ready to go back to the office the next morning and tell Rabbi El or whoever, I can't do it. Someone else has to do it. You know, I was ready to admit I, I couldn't, it's not shy. My father, I remember, who was a, you know, was a, a early riser, a late sleeper, he was, uh, suddenly he's short, walking around and he sees I'm like uh, all, uh, like, uh, you know, all disturbed. And he said to me, what's going on? He said, I said, I, I, you know, I have to write this Fabrengen and I can't even get one page out. So I remember he told me calmly, he said to me, my father was a writer himself, not a chizer, not maniach, but he was a writer and had a lot of years of experience. He said to me, I remember these words, he said, that's how it works. That's the process of writing. You keep throwing out the garbage. At some point, you keep doing it. 40 drafts, 50, 60, you can take 100. You'll finally get the page. And more importantly, he said, remember that this will be forever. Not just now, all the rest of your years of writing, you'll always know. In the beginning, it's always going to be difficult. And you're never going to be able to do it quickly. The difference between now and in five years from now is in five years from now, you'll know you can do it. Now you don't know you can do it yet. Remember, that's what he says, like running a marathon. Once you do it, it's still difficult every time, but you know you can do it. 100% right. He was right on target. I, I trusted him simply by Kabbalah sales, not like I had the experience. And I kept hacking at it. By, by around 9 o'clock in the morning, um, I finally got out the first page, what I can consider decent, that I thought reflected at least what I... And then after that, it got easier and easier. But he was right. Till this day, I write. It's always difficult to write. But you know you can do it, so you... There's a light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. So you know you're going to go through the frustration. That was my first experience. So it was very, <laughs> I did not think I could do it. And then it worked, and I did it. And I got that Fabrengen out. I finished it Friday, right before Lichtzen. Now, next Shabbos was an, uh, the case, Vayigash. No, there was no Fabrengen, Vayigash. But we didn't know there won't be a Fabrengen. I had to be ready. You can't have Fabrengen's overlapping Fabrengen. So I had to be finished before Shabbos. And then it got, I was to be able to do it in three, four days after that. And that, Fabrengen, just for the record, I wrote maybe 25 questions to the Rebbe. And I guess, again, it was maybe the Rebbe's welcoming me. That, as there's so many Hagos on that Sikha, it was never a Mugadik of Fabrengen. But if you look at it, it's all filled with the Rebbe's notes and comments and so on. On all the pages, the Rebbe edited it beginning to end from all over. So uh, that, uh, that was a, once I got through that hurdle, it never was quite as difficult, but still, the challenge was there. That was my first Those notes from foray. the Rebbe on that Hanocha was responding to the specific questions that you asked, or he edited, he was my gear the whole Sikha, just unofficially? The way it worked was, in the context of Hagos, um, you all know Lakut Sikhas, right? Lakut Sikhas was initially prepared a short, abbreviated version of a Fabrein last year, two years ago, or a combination. And the Rebbe was my gear that uh, every week. 
Hanochis, the process was getting down everything the Rebbe said at the Shabbos Fabrengen, or Yom Tif, and wasn't expected the Rebbe was going to edit it. There were times where it was a pretty clear, like a sikha, let's say, Achashah uh, Pesach, Tov Shemem Dalad, the Rebbe first came out about the Takon of Rambam. So it was pretty clear that it was going to be Magia, Hayrol, the Rabbim, like that. But generally speaking, uh, Hanukkah was not necessarily going to be Muge. So there were a few scenarios. There were sikhs that we knew the Rebbe would want to edit, so we prepared it as such, and the Rebbe Taka edited it. There were times we prepared something and the Rebbe didn't edit it. There were times the Rebbe asked for a sikha, that he wanted a certain sikha prepared and he edited. There were times that we sent it in, pr- not edited, and published already, and the Rebbe edited it after it was printed. So you had a lot of different pictures. Then there were those like Mikates, where we asked questions, and based on the questions, we worked in the Rebbe's edits, and sometimes we would give it back to the Rebbe, did we work in your edits correctly? So the Rebbe would then edit a section that was based on the, his answers that he gave us. In the process, sometimes the Rebbe would edit more. So Mikates had, had everything, had all the above. There's no full sikh in Mikates that I could say is edited, but there are entire sections. And sometimes we'll say, Mikan atzif tezvov, huga yidei kvet gushra or if we didn't put Hanochas Atmim built in Muga on the page, that's a sign that there were edits from the Rebbe on that page. There are ways to figure out. And sometimes you see real footnotes that the Rebbe edited and wrote. They were, they were fascinating, those. Any of you like physics? I'll give you just one thing the Rebbe wrote, if you like physics and chassidus. So the, the Rebbe was speaking, if I may, example. Um, so the Rebbe spoke then, I told you, Klal Prat Klal. Koyach and Poyal was a big theme. Remember, Sabbath Hanukkah. So Koyach and Poel, Shamei and Hillel, there's a lot of, those were the themes. It was very abstract ideas. So the Rebbe brought a dogma for Koyach and Poel from uh, the Pasha's Mikates. That was the Pasha. So we all know, Yosef tells his brothers the, his dreams. And then there's this strange posuk. The brothers, of course, get jealous and they get upset. But it says, V'oviv shomer asadover. Yaakov heard the dreams. The expression, V'oviv shomer asadover. What does that mean? And Yaakov watched over what was going on. So the Gemara says that Yaakov, that kol ha'chaleim is heilich achar ha'pisrin. A dream follows its interpretation. And if you don't interpret it, it won't be fulfilled necessarily. So Yaakov Shomer Sadovid, he decided, I'm not going to interpret it, because who says it's going to be fulfilled? So the Rebbe touched upon this and said, what does that mean? Manushach, if it's a dream that's real, if it's a, a Baba Maisa dream, so obviously it won't be fulfilled. It's nonsense. Every dream has some Dvarim Betelim nonsense. But if it's a real dream, who cares whether you interpret it or not? So the Rebbe said there's a state didn't use these words, I'm just translating into English, where it's still a state of probability that it can go either way, and when you interpret it, you're giving it substance. That's why when you have a bad dream, you're often told to ignore it, because by interpreting it, you're giving it reality. It's like the idea of an Ayn Hara. Ayn Hara only affects someone that believes in it. In other words, you give, it, you give power to, uh, to negative energy if you consider it, if you take it seriously. So the Rebbe then when we pre- presented to the Rebbe, the Rebbe wrote her there, which I found fascinating. He said, Yesh lemer al in Umaza and Gdusha, where it says in Samach Vov that before there's Sviris, Esa Sviris, there's a level of Sviris Ein Ketz. Why? Because there's a state where the Sviris can be, all the potential possibilities are there. And then the Abishta chose to take from those from those all those possibilities, potential, and make it actually ten spheres. Now, if you're familiar with quantum mechanics, there's the concept of an indeterministic, what they call a state of probability. That before something is defined, even though it's hard for us to imagine, because by us a table is a table, it's not a chair. You know, an apple tree is not an orange tree. But there are states in the quantum level, in the subatomic particles, that are neither we don't know if it's going to be a wave or a particle, for example, with light. I'm not going to go through all the details, but the Rebbe was clearly suggesting that there's a state, like a dream state, that's like more of a superconscious state that has not yet gotten defined one way or another. So that was one of the others that Rebbe wrote there. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's jump ahead and talk about, you know, the Rebbe had different genres of sikhs. Was there a certain genre that was more difficult consistently for you to follow? 
Well, look, um, sometimes the Rebbe would speak very hafshotadik, which means, like, I remember a Bolok Tovshim and Beis, it was a very long Fabreng and went over 100 pages, maybe 120 pages Hanukkah. Went like till 6.30, five hours or more. And the Rebbe spoke then about, I think, the Asar Ma'am Maris Nivra Elam, Bamaimer Echad Yochali Baris. It was extremely abstract. The hardest genre is when the Rebbe spoke in this very Hafshotadik language, which can be interpreted in many ways. You know, for example, Rashi Sicha, even though some of them were very deep and complex, but they were very concrete because it's a Rashi, it's a text. You could follow the text. Here's a question, here's an answer. But the more Rafshotadik, especially in Chsidis, could be really very complicated because the Rebbe was speaking. And it didn't always have exactly like, he's not quoting necessarily a mimer. The Rebbe was explaining an idea. And uh, some of those were extremely difficult. And we would argue about it. I remember I would argue with Rabbi El and, you know, what did the Rebbe mean? Sometimes we mamish, the chizrim that is, had dif- we disagreed mamish min akotza la kotza. We couldn't even agree what the point. One person said it was day, one person said it was night. That's how hafshat the it was. Those were the probably the hardest genres. Um, this was a tape fabring, but it was also very, uh, the seam of the Rambam in Tov Shalam et Hay, which later became a printed book about Motzei and Eina Motzei, if you're familiar with the Rebbe's Sichas. It's very, it's a classic. When the Rebbe said it, Yutas Kislev Tov Shalam et Hay, so I remember hearing it, and thank God there was a tape of that, but there would be no way that we would have been able to, able to write that down. That was one of the hardest fabrengans. Because also when the Rebbe would become like a Mayan Amizgaber, like literally like you're going to sea and there's no end. And the Rebbe would start throwing my Mare Chazal and connecting one thing to the next thing. That would also be very difficult. And it was like a shorter Sikha at the beginning and an end. When the Rebbe would start bringing from all Chalke and every part, you had to really concentrate. So those were some of them. Um, sometimes Hadronim. There's no real rule. Because you never knew when it's going to come. And uh, one more thing I would say, you have to keep in mind also, Fabringen's like Simchas Teireh before the Hakafas was one of the most compl- one of the most deepest Fabringen's Chassidus. And it was extremely noisy in 770. Because remember, we're going from the Fabringen to Hakafas and have the shoulder didn't know if it was Hakafas or Fabringen. It's like a chicken market. I'm telling you, your Pasha couldn't hear. Um, I had to move literally within a foot or two from the Rebbe. I stood close to the Rebbe. I moved all the way up. Rabbi El would point to me, stop making his ears, you know, <laughs> that he couldn't hear anything. And that was the hardest, really, because not so much, because besides the the theme, the Teichen was very complex, if you missed a word, what do you do then? There's no no recourse. And I can tell you, I remember the last hour of that Fabrengen, I'm not saying to toot my horn, I had no one to turn to afterwards. Rabbi El didn't hear it. And many, most people didn't hear it. And I had to write it, so I had no choice. I, what am I going to write? You know, I couldn't just say, okay, we, we you know, chaser. <laughs> so, um, and it was, uh, that was very big pressure. I had to move as close as possible. And then remember, go right from that to our coffers, and with all the drinking. I didn't drink, obviously, but there's no chazara right away, because it's still yontif, till the next night. Just to really thicken the plot, if Simchas Teda was Friday, so the Fabreng was Thursday night, there was a Fabreng on Friday night, it's so Fabreng on Shabbos afternoon, 1.30, another Fabreng that began before the Shkia, Shabbos late afternoon, all before you could even write down one word, it was all Yontif. So we had four Fabrengans, almost four Fabrengans to Chazer, we couldn't sometimes even agree which Fabreng, and the Rebbe said something, honestly. Not, because, <laughs> because, because it was all from memory. And sometimes, one second, was that if I bring before our coffers or after our coffers or the next night? So that was, that was definitely, from a point of view, simply the sheer amount of material. And also, um, you know, people always ask, I'm sure you, I don't know if you're going to ask this, why don't you divide it? This one remembers the first hour, this one remembers the second hour. So let me just tell you right up front, it doesn't work that way. If you can't remember five minutes, you can't remember five hours. If you can remember five hours, you'll remember five minutes. It doesn't work that way. The brain doesn't run out of a hard drive. It's not a hard drive that runs out of memory. Either you have it or you don't have it. So it wasn't, this, it wasn't like we divide. The only thing that could happen is you get, your mind gets tired. So hours wear on, your mind simply, you need a lot of uh, stamina simply to keep not just alert, but really sharp and uh, 
And that was difficult when it went long for bringings. But there was division with the Maimorim. You weren't responsible for trans to writing the, memorizing and transcribing the Maimorim, right? So here's how it worked. The, from the Chazara point of view, yeah, we were responsible to remember everything. Whoever could remember, remembered. Remember, you didn't have, I mean, people think there were a lot of Chazar. There were very, very few that could, when I say a Chazar, I mean someone that could hear a five-hour Fabrengen and sit down a minute later and repeat five hours. Very few could do that. There were people, you know, there was like the, of course, if you're, you're I'm, I'm, I'm Chazaring, I'm sure you'll have what to add to it. But that's, that's like the Ibcha Mistaver. You know, you say this Vada and I'll tell you Fakert. You know, so there are definitely people that helped, but there weren't many that could really do that. So whoever could do it had to do it. There was no choice. Um, the writing was the, was the vision of labor. Um, there were the, my modern writers in my day was Svi Greenblatt when, in, in the late Lamets, then David Oladot and Shalom Kharatonov. I did write a few my modern simply because either no one was around, etc. Um, but uh, I, I, I was primarily a Sikha writer, but that was writing. The Chazara, we all, everybody contributed. Got it. Yeah. What did you do between the Sikhs? When the Nikunabu, was there some device that you were using then to help you? You mean like a hidden tape recorder? No. Uh, there are many methods. Uh, I think before I talk about between the Sikha, let me just share an important point. Which, uh, the key to really memory, and this is the real secret, um, and I actually do workshops on this these days. I'm, I even wrote up a draft of a book, you know, Secrets of the Mind that, my, that I learned through my years of remembering. Because I learned things about the mind that would blow your mind, honestly. Because completely counterintuitive what memory is like. So let me just say two things about it, and then I'll share what, what we did between the sikhs. Memory, everyone thinks, is a power of the intellect. The smarter the person, the more they remember. It's not true. You'll see many, many smart people, they don't have good memories. Smart people may be able to understand something, grasp something quickly, maybe understand things deeply, but memory is not a faculty of pure intelligence. It's actually a faculty of the opposite of intelligence. Let me explain. You know who remembers best as a group? Children. Children. The stories you heard, the songs you heard, as a child, remain etched in your memory forever. Adults find it very difficult to remember. We have all kinds of tricks and we have to write notes and this business. Try teaching a 20-year-old a new language. Children, five-year-olds, are learning three-year-olds, are learning ABC. And why? Because they, I'll tell you why, because a child's mind is like a dry sponge. Who, who absorbs best? A dry sponge. Adult mind is a wet sponge. A saturated sponge doesn't absorb as well. So the smarter you are and the more ideas you have actually works against memory because your ideas get in the way. Let's put it in different words. If you're familiar with, uh, if any of you have learned Hilchus Kashrus, the Gemara, Chulin, I did the Torah Lemivla Le Polit. You're busy absorbing, you can't be exuding. You're busy exuding, you can't be absorbing. Uh, simply put, you can't speak and listen at the same time. I know some people think they can, but it doesn't work. So when you're listening, listening to the Rebbe speak, the key thing is to put away your intelligence and just absorb what is being said without processing anything. I know it sounds weird. Obviously, you have to have your ears open and you have to have some intelligence. You have to know the language, etc. But the less processing. The more I understood what the Rebbe said, the worse I remembered it. I remember this vividly. Ve'yikra tov shemem. The Rebbe spoke a whole thing about yove teherim, yisasku b'teherim. That children, you start learning ve'yikra with them because the teherim, study Tehirim. And a whole thing that I've spoken, Nigla, a whole thing about Tara and, and Kedusha, it was, it was, I didn't understand anything of that Sikha. After the Fabring, and I asked Rabbi El, he says he never heard this, he doesn't know what the Rebbe was talking about. Because it was, you know, usually the ideas that I've talked, he may have talked before, Bikitzer, here was like a whole new sugya. And I remember, I remember this Sikha better than any other Sikha. Because since I had no pre, uh, no pre-coordinates, I had no preconceived, you know, if it was an idea that I spoke about Mamala Klam, Seva Klam, and so we all have something to, you know, don't people who know this topic. Because I didn't know the topic, I was able to chazer it the best, because it was completely based on, not, I have no idea what the Rebbe said, what the Rebbe meant. Then we found, it was a whole Gemara in Zvachim, and then we realized it was a whole sugya that the Rebbe never spoke about before. That I remember vividly. So as counterintuitive as it sounds, understanding is not, is, works against remembering. So the key is, first you have to absorb 
you put it down on paper, then you begin the process of really processing. That was the key, key thing. So in that context, what do we do after a sikha? What I did at least, one of my methods was, remember, memory fades immediately. It doesn't fade a day later. It doesn't fade hours later. It's like it says, Tinuk Mishir, Neilad Maskal Yisyavosh. Memory begins fading immediately. The only difference is, a minute afterwards, it's not going to fade completely. A year later, it'll fade completely. So knowing that, you can't take for granted anything. Most of us think we're smarter than we are. And when you hear something that you like, you think I'm always going to retain it. Try it out. Try repeating to somebody after what you hear tonight, to someone without notes or anything. You're going to say, I remember I heard something really interesting, and then say, no, what do you remember? I'm not really, you know, I don't have the right words. What happened? Because you really didn't understand, you didn't really absorb it. What you heard was a good idea. So the first thing we had to do was essentially repeat. What I would do after a sikha, when they were singing the nigan, I would go over, like, a, make a mental map of all the flow of ideas. I actually would number it. Sometimes I would number, like, the Rebbe said, 72 things. And I would go in my mind, just like, you know, let's say someone's driving you somewhere, you want to remember, did you make a right or left, uh, another left or right? So you like say, okay, after two blocks, we made a right, then we made a left. So I would like make a mental map in my mind. The Rebbe started with, let's say, today Shabbos, Pasha's uh, Shmois, and then went a certain logical sequence, and then the Rebbe went on a tangent. So I made a mental note to myself that the Rebbe went off to a certain point. And I would do that the concentration needed to do that is very, very uh, difficult because it's so easy to say, okay, I remember that already, let me move on. So I really would go over the whole sikha point by point from beginning to end through the, when, the, when I was singing the nigan. That changed everything because essentially what I did by, by doing that, my mind had made a carbon copy of what I had heard. Remember, you don't remember what you heard, you remember what you remember you heard. That's why we often... Make, make, make even our stories that happen with us change uh, shape and form over the years because you remember what you remember. So I would try to do this as many times as possible. It's like making a copy of a copy of a copy. I probably would do it four or five times till the end of Shabbos. So I did it once between the sikhs, then become the next sikhs. So I had to do it again and again. Then when I went home after the Fabring and I probably brought some Bokram with me and we would do it again. And I try to do it as many times because the more you did that, the, more, the fresher it was. So when Shabbos ended, by that time, you already had reviewed it at least three, four, five times. The more I did, the better the memory was. Sometimes I got lazy, to be honest. Or sometimes I took for granted. I thought, oh, this one's going to be an easy one. And those were the hardest because I didn't do the, this, this, uh, the, the, the hard work. So doing that was the key after a sikha to create that mental map. And if you have the numbers... Then what happens later is, okay, one second, I only got 65 out of 72. What happened? But at least you know that you're missing something, so now you have to figure it out. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Now on your right, there's a few envelopes. Um, did you bring some things that can help demonstrate um, some of the things that we're talking about? <laughs> so I, I, so the, Rav, the rabbi asked me to bring a few things. I also sent them something that I will share with you all as a tshura, uh, as a go, <laughs> a go away gift uh, before you go. Um, I mean, send it by phone. You could send it. I, I once prepared something from different manuscripts. So just to give you a little background, what I have here, I just quickly chose a few things that I had in my hand. Most of it is actually locked away in a safe deposit box um, because you might have heard of the concept of a chesidosh geneva. You know what that is? A theft, it's called. It means that um, these are pretty much invaluable uh, material because it's the Rebbe's original handwriting. So I have copies of it, of course, but I also have originals. I have all the originals. That was the re actually the only reward we got. We weren't paid for this work, just for the record, um, as important as it was. I mean, later, once I got married, we started raising money, but it wasn't. Uh, it's not a career you want to pursue if you want to make money. Let's put it this way. Um, there are other benefits. So what the, what, what the reward we did get was the Rebbe would not let, uh, all the Rebbe's answers had to be returned to the Rebbe. Nobody got an answer. This is already in the early, in the mid-50s. Uh, um, people were writing to the Rebbe just to get a ksavya, to get a manuscript, and then the Rebbe stopped. So no one got manuscripts anymore. But we were the only ones because of the work we did. It was like, I guess, uh, but it was also for public 
for the public benefit because in case later you want to check for Sikha has a mistake and this, you can always go back to the original manuscript. So I had this chus, uh, I mean, I've literally probably a few thousand pages of the Rebbe's handwriting. And it's uh, fascinating to see. First of all, you just see the Rebbe's, you know, it's almost like artistic in a way. And in some cases, actually, you'll find the Rebbe even, even we even found crumbs of what the Rebbe was eating when he was editing the Sikha. So we even have the crumbs in some cases. Um, don't ask me what we do Pesach, we just, uh, whatever. But, but because of the, th- the, the, the value here, um, I, have to, I can't keep it in any way, a place that's not protected. So I put them into safe deposit boxes, which also protects it from uh, weather issues or fire, God forbid, or stuff like that. But I do have a few that I was working with, so I brought it here. So I'll show you guys. This is uh, you know, something quite uh, unique. Some people won't want to touch it if you didn't go to the mikveh, maybe. But this is the Rebbe actually, not just he held it, he actually edited it. And you'll see mostly it's pencil, sometimes pen. I just, as I said, a few of them, I'll, t- I'll give a little background. And um, I'll try, I don't want to really want to pass it around. Maybe if you guys want to come around, I'll show it to you. So I don't want it to be in any way. Let's yeah, just no. uh, do it generally now, and then maybe after uh, okay, people good, come good, yeah, I'll just give you a little sense of it. And this is just, um, just a little selection of... of uh, the work we did, I mean, this was really on a, almost on a daily or even weekly basis where we had these interactions. And as I said, the Rebbe would always answer. And it was the most exciting thing, what can I tell you, to see these answers because sometimes it was very, you know, <laughs> very sensitive matters. So let's see what I have here. I'll just start from the top. Okay. Um, Okay, yeah, you hold the mic if you don't mind. Ah, okay. Yeah, this is an interesting one. So I'll show it to you guys. See? So that's actual original pencil handwriting. This is the Rebbe writing. Um, Yeah, yeah, of course I'll tell you. I just want to show it first, okay? Everybody sees? Yeah, huh? Pencil doesn't fade. No, pencil actually don't fade. This is, you're talking now over 40 years ago. Now, pencil doesn't fade. Pen p- actually fades more than pens, but the Rebbe's pen or pencil never fades. Not for miraculous reasons, just doesn't. <laughs> I mean, the paper can fade faster because paper is acidic and it could, you know. Okay, so this is an answer to a question. It's actually a, a deep Indian exodus. So we write like this. I'll just quickly give you the sense. It says, Nisker ba'asicha, maimer sefer yitzira, she'en l'mayla ma'enig. So there's an expression in Yosef Yitzhida that there's nothing higher than Einig. And af she yesh neshak v'tari and samach vav, what's higher, rotzen or tainug? So the Rebbe goes on to explain what samach vav says. So we add a few questions about what the Rebbe said. So first we get a chelik godel from the Rebbe here. Doesn't like that we're getting into, delving into such deep topics. So the Rebbe writes, kama v'kama mekush yaseim ba'ovar, a number of your questions recently in this type of signin, this, this, this style in other words you're having a problem that there are contradictions in different places of chesidus when the Rebbe, Mitla Rebbe, sometimes he writes an idea, and then he says, with the Loi Canal. It's not like it was what I wrote before. So based on you, that everything has to fit. Why, how could the Mitla Rebbe himself say an idea and then say it's not like that? In other words, the Rebbe is not appreciating that we don't understand the subtleties, that not everything has to be consistent. There could be different approaches to something. There could be contradictions. Not everything has to be reconciled. That's basically um, the Rebbe writing. And then the Rebbe writes, "V'ulai sof sof ya'ainu b'reish atanya, b'hago." And maybe at the end of it all, you'll finally look at the beginning of Tanya. The Rebbe underlines the word "b'reish atanya," where it says, "V'ayim ponim l'teira," that there's seventy different facets to the teira. And then after we get this, this is what we call you did this brivel. You know, this is like this, this. Uh, I don't want to say slap in the face because I don't see it that way at all because this itself has a lot of powerful messages. 
I'll tell you in a moment. And then the Rebbe does answer the question. So right here, you'll see there's a line the Rebbe makes after he gives this uh, so-called chilek. He makes a little line, the Rebbe's line, and then speaks, etzema einig. And then he talks about what is etzema einig, what's sheirisha einig, ikra einig. I don't want to go through the whole nuances, but there's a lot, huh? <laughs> okay. You know, maybe you're beyond you, but it's not beyond them. <laughs> That's true, but we have a limited time. Yeah. I noticed that the note, you didn't sign it, but other notes I've seen that you... You did. You used to sign your name at the bottom of the question. No, I never signed the name, except if it was more of a like more of a administrative thing, <coughs> like if we wrote to the Rebbe, should we change the letters of the publication, or Hatzah to print the kavitz. So then I would sign a name. It was more just to show who's writing. But the, the, this, but the questions on sikhs were just not signed. Um, yeah, they were not signed. No. Anyway, the Rebbe. So how did I feel? I have to be very honest with you. I, I felt I was a professional, and I was getting instruction from the top professional of them all. So actually, all this to me was chinuch, education. I never took anything personally. I never took it like, you know, I didn't have thin skin. There were people I worked with that had big problem every time they'd get a chilek. They, they couldn't sleep for a week. I was much more callous than that, I guess. Um, I don't mean that. I meant to say, not to, I took it as the Rebbe, I saw the Rebbe like a master surgeon with a scalpel. Every nuance mattered. And I learned from it. What I learned from this is precision. Much of my, uh, if you call it Hatzlach, if you want to call it, much of my success today is a result of the precision I learned from the Rebbe. The diuk, subtleties, things like sometimes the Rebbe did not like when things were written black and white, he wanted it gray. <coughs> People don't realize that. Every letter counts. I mean, I can go on and on, precision. That's what I learned from all of this. So every time the Rebbe wrote, whatever it was, to me it was always a tremendous education. I see and in the language of your question yeah. that the Rebbe seems to have marked up your question itself. Yeah, very often. He would either mark it up or sometimes edit within it. Here he wrote a whole answer uh, after, after it. Okay, so that's one example. Let's take another one. I may. This is more of an answer. This was, just for the record, this was... Balak Tovshim Em Gimel. But in Lamaila Ma'enin. You want to know the source. Okay. Let's see what other goodies we have here. What is this gem? Okay. So this is probably a whole, uh, let me see what this is. Oh, Shkach Abratis. This is the Maimer Yutshvat Basilagani Tovshim Mem. When the Rebbe, after 30 years of the Rebbe, the 30th anniversary of the Rebbe's leadership. So this again, you'll see pencil. See, the Rebbe wrote Hanocha, the Rebbe's words, which meant that some Maimorim, the Rebbe wanted to say Hanocha. It's Muge, but he called it Hanocha. Many Maimorim just says Maimor, uh, just, just doesn't say Hanocha. Hanocha usually meant it wasn't maybe written as sharp as the Rebbe wanted. You can interpret it many ways. So he wrote Hanocha here, but he edited it seriously. What you see is a footnote here on the side, just to show you. Every page is edited. Usually, sometimes small edits, like a line uh, up, uh, here and there. Uh, just to go through uh, quickly. Oh, here, actually, interesting thing. The Rebbe wrote something and then cut it off at the bottom of the page. <laughs> so we have no idea what he wrote. Wow. So trust me, we sat hours trying to figure it out. Because <laughs> that was like more intriguing than all. What did the Rebbe write? Then why would he, you know? We even looked at the next page. Maybe the, the trace went over. So that was it. The Rebbe cut it off. <laughs> So, um, and this is what you see here, the edits. I mean, I, I'm not going to go through the actual edits. Each one is, so it's page after page. But you could see how much time the Rebbe put into this. This was probably, and the footnotes, um, sometimes again, these are edits. Here the Rebbe crosses out a half, half a footnote. So he crossed out. Sometimes at this one, the Rebbe adds a mimer from Tafresh Pei. And uh, here we wrote a note afterwards. And the Rebbe edited the note, crosses out some stuff. That note made it into the mimer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was like a Mitsuru Bzehagel. Okay, we sent the Gellies and we, we wrote something and the Rebbe added some, some notes. And then in those days, the custom was the Rebbe edited everything twice. Twice. So after this was finished, after what we do is we give this to the printer and he set and add all the Rebbe's notes in it. 
And then we would give the Rebbe back a typeset version. So here's what we call the second Hagah, Hagah Shnia. This came as galleys. Galleys would be longer pages like this. It's the same Imer, but this is now the Rebbe's second edits. So you see Hanoch is there already, and everything in the first edits are in incorporated, but then the Rebbe edited more. Sometimes small things. Here, the Rebbe, that's my handwriting, but everything else, the pencil is all the Rebbe. That handwriting was on the page when it went into the Rebbe? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, sometimes when we read it, we added something, something was missing. Or So all this is the Rebbe's edits again. And, and let's see the last page. One second. Who was this printer that understood how to put the Hagar? Well, we would write it over for him. And the printers were good. They were, they were Motl Shusterman, uh, Schoenberg, uh, Pevsner, um, uh, Maishver at some point, Motl Chain. Balshan. They were like Empire Press today. It was Balshan. Remember, they also published all the Merkus for him, all the Kohos for him. So they were accustomed to it. They, so, so sometimes they would actually get the Ksavyad. We didn't give them the Ksavyad. We would give them rewritten. Here the Rebbe writes, Levader bedig duke sofrim. Sometimes he'd give us notes. that like Sometimes the Rebbe would write to us, check it out. Check out something. You know, in this place, in that place. Um, here the Rebbe writes, Dafke mara mokem hishmitu. Exclamation point. Two, two points. Sh yeah, two exclamation points. Which mara mokem shulchan arachad murazok. So we would get it over our heads at many times, and that was perfectly fine. We learned from it. Um, and that is the Mimer Pasuligani. There you go. You wrote the Hanukkah for this Mimer? The Tavshin Mem, or someone else wrote it? No, this, um, who wrote this? I didn't write it. No, it wasn't me. It's probably, uh, maybe, I could check. Maybe it was Abiel even. Because he'd like to always usually write the Basiligani um, Yeah, And finally, one more thing. Let's see, what is this? Big envelope because of the big pages. Okay, let's check out this. What is this? Let me see. Is that the original envelope? Oh, this is. No, we didn't send it in with an envelope. We sent it in just with a paper clip. Then later I put it into envelopes. Oh, this is a very fascinating one. Every year, um, you know, Rabbi Weinberg would learn Tanya on the radio. I actually do it now in Matzai Shabbos. So every year when it came to the time, like the Siyum, well, it wasn't a Siyum. Every year the anniversary when he began teaching was around Mishpatim or Truma. So the Rebbe would speak a Sikh every year about learning Tanya on the radio. And this year, this year, Tov Shemem Dalet, very heavy, heavy Sikh, unbelievable Sikh. And so these are the edits to that sikha. This is Mishpatim Memdalat. So the edits, well, as it gets goes moves moves further. This is printed. This is printed. Everything Muga, by the way, is printed somewhere. It's not nothing here. Oh, look at this page. Here's a little artistic page. All that is the Rebbe's Hagas. You know, all over the sides. So sometimes the Rebbe would just let it flow. See? All this. You can see it? Okay, yeah, this one too. These two, these few pages were very heavily edited, and this became a mugadik sikh. This is printed in chelik chovov in the esophis. You know, when you see a full sikh, mishpatim tavshin chav mem dalit, tavshin dalit mem. If it doesn't say built in muga, it's muga, and everything printed in the kute sikhs is muga. So later years, it became the sefer asikhs. In Tovshim Mem Zayim Mem Ches Mem Tes, because then the Rebbe edited ev almost every week. Okay. Did the Rebbe use different papers? Like, it wouldn't fit up there until you know what the exact Yeah, I'm going to show you now an example of that. I don't. This I don't have the original here. I only have a copy. See this? So when the Sikha came out with the Rebbe's edits, the Rebbe wrote a whole page to us, and he writes on top, Mokim Hamasim, to add this in the prop appropriate place. So the Rebbe wrote up a whole piece. He added a whole sif. And it's, ad it's added there. And he expected it, you to figure that out? Where, where to fit it? Yeah. yeah. If we couldn't do that, <laughs> it, 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 we could write five hours of Fabreng and we can't figure out how to fit it in. Um, 
you know. Anyway, this is a fascinating piece, by the way, about technology. And this is Mem Dalit. We're talking about 1984. So no internet yet. Just the beginning of the PC. So I mean, you know, it's very early. The first PC came out in 84, approximately. Or 85, even. Um, and the Rebbe is speaking about learning Tanya on the radio, and he's answering the Tanya that many people had. T the radio is full of garbage on it. You turn the channel, you could hear Echvezvos. Avedezora, Gilearais, who knows what. So many people said, how could you use a radio to teach Tanya? So I'm not going to read the whole piece, but Bikitsa, the Rebbe writes, Chaz v'sholem v'rachmonot l'tzlan tzuzogen, asitra achre kem bashafen epes vos, afila hanemola, ubechlal az emetzer mechutz Hashem ken epes bashafen. And he goes on, and he says, how much more so, here's how he defines technology. Al derech kol zeb negei radio, akoyach adir velcha Hashem od arangi geben beteva. As durech akeli masim, is Kela Madaber, Nishma Mesefe Elam Vat Sefe, Uberega Kememra. It's the Rebbe's own Shaviyad. So, how the Rebbe defines uh, radio, but it's the same thing technology. And the Rebbe also added footnotes, so we added this. But in, in addition, the Rebbe wrote another thing. He wrote also, this is also an interesting uh, revelation most people don't know. The Rebbe wrote another piece. And he writes at the end, Mimichtav, dot, dot, dot. So this is not a letter that ever wrote to anyone, but they ever wrote it as if it was a letter, and he said we should write that it's a letter, from a letter. Which is fine, because the Rebbe can write his letters any way he wants to. It's a letter to us. So he, that's how he wrote it. So this is all printed in the Sikha. You can look at Chelik Chavov, Mishpatim. You're familiar with the Sikha, right? It's a famous Sikha. It's a very powerful Fabrengen Sikha. And that is Mishpatim Mem Dalit. And then there's the second Agar, which I'll show you as well. And if I have it here, do I have it here? Let me see. Yeah, I have it in here. So this is the second edit, as I said before. And here again, the Rebbe. So actually, just for the record, when we added that piece, the Rebbe had a chance to look at it. If he didn't like where it was, he could have changed it. So just for the record. Um, but but he but he, the Rebbe agreed where we should put it. And here are some uh, you know the edits of these pages. Let's see. Want to check it out? This is a Pirsim mission. I don't think it's ever been published. I don't think anyone has it. The Ganovim didn't get a hold of it yet. But now you guys have some videos of it, which is fine. If the Rebbe was uh, here, he'd probably demand that you all learn it before you picture, take pictures of it. Did you ever have an instance where the galleys came back with no edits? The Rebbe says it's good commercial. No. <laughs> sometimes few, sometimes the Rebbe read Einazman Gromelagia and just go with the first. We had times we sent the first I got and there were no edits. Then it wasn't edited. Right. Once the Rebbe even wrote once uh, Einu Muga. There are times the Rebbe looked at something. Here you see the Rebbe's more footnotes here. The Rebbe actually wrote, Einu Muga, even though he edited it. Because I guess he was not, he didn't want to take a chreis. It wasn't really well written. You know, there are some, sometimes we got answers. Oh boy, they were sharp. Yeah, so let, let's pick up over there. So it's, okay, it's, so it's, fine. It's, this is a little taste, my friends. I hope you uh, enjoyed the presentation, this presentation. Let's let's ask a few more questions, Rabbi. Is that okay? I'm ready to. Listen. Okay, good. I have a few more questions. My chayes is my life. Was this? Okay, perfect. So there is sometimes and maybe that they want to ask questions. Yeah, sure. We're going to open it up in a moment. I'm, so there's a number uh, of instances in where the Rebbe would write on the side of the sicha. You mentioned about the sharp responses. The Rebbe would use the word mavil, which <laughs> I think means something like shocking. Maybe you have a better translation. Was there a certain? Um, was there a certain theme, or was it predictable, or what was the? When were the instances when the Rebbe would use that type of term? Um, okay, so mavil means shocking, right? It was a very common expression. Um, so the different categories. Sometimes things were blatantly. Uh, 
out of line. Sometimes we couldn't even figure out why there was a mavil. Because the Rebbe's mind, a little thing that was a little off, you know, like a revaval begat you know, a little piece of dust. Um, I think recently, with, with that sikha that you pointed out when we walked in, was there a mavil there? I don't remember. But that would have been a category of a mavil. I'll just give one example. I don't know if the Rebbe actually wrote Mavil there. But there's the, that idea. The Rebbe was talking about the Mitla Rebbe, that's Alter Rebbe and the Mitla Rebbe, that's Chochm and Bina. So in Chesidus, Kabbalah, in Zoyar, it says, Chochm and Bina is Trey Rein Deloy Misparshin, Echad Loy Kayim Beli Hasheni, or something like that. Okay, so two friends that are not are inseparable. So that's Chochm and Bina. But then, for some reason, I decided to add the second half, that one is not complete or not, uh, not without the other. And the Rebbe, oh, they're not like that. He said, who, who writes something like that on the Mitla Rebbe and the Alta Rebbe, on the Alta Rebbe and the Mitla Rebbe? The second half. Trein le mispashen, fine. Who writes that? So I don't know if he wrote Mavil, but that would, be, that would warrant a Mavil. <laughs> now, I just want to point out, I'm not saying in my defense, obviously I was wrong and we corrected it, and I, I'm not, uh, <laughs> the Rebbe caught it, and that was that. But remember, we're talking about Chochm and Bina of Atzilus. I'm not talking about Chochm uh, and Bina of a uh, few, two uh, fools. So Chochm and Bina of Atzilus, there's no problem to write that one doesn't fulfill the other. But a Rebbe, with another Rebbe, you can't write it. That was what I remember taking away from that. Now again, I'm not defending. We shouldn't have written it because firstly, the Rebbe didn't say those words. The reason I wrote it was because it made stronger so-called the Kesher of the Alter Rebbe Mitler. But at the end of the day, you're also suggesting one is not complete without the other. The Rebbe didn't... Uh, there was another time he wrote Navil. I wrote about the Tzemach Tzedek, the Rebbe von Yenem Dor. And the Rebbe wrote Navil. <laughs> and the Rebbe changed it to Bedere. Now you tell me, what's the difference between Yenem Dor and Bedere? So I don't see much difference in the language. But Yenem Dor sounds like, you know, like, uh, like in the distant past. But Dere means in his generation. In other words, if I wrote in Zain Dor, but not Yenem Dor. So that was uh, another example. Now again, most of you, if you read it, you would say, well, you wouldn't probably catch it. It's not like a blatant mistake. But on the level that, uh, remember, there's the Rebbe Sichas, and this is the data for generations, for posterity, and it's not accurate. Uh, another place, more, not so much Mavil would be with the Rebbe did not like. You pointed it out to me, and, and I have quite a few of these. With the Rebbe did not like when we've gotten to very deep and del delicate sugis and chassidus. The Rebbe would say, are you thinking about the readers or are you thinking about your own understanding of chassidus? In other words, the Rebbe didn't like it. Said, You're writing it for the public. Write something they're really going to enjoy. You're going to start getting into these nuances and these subtleties. You're just going to, it's not a foot of on a And the Rebbe was very adamant about that many times. To be very honest, I have to admit, and actually I learned this from Rabiel himself, we still did it. Because to be able to schlep out from the Rebbe, some chiddush and chiddush was too much of a taiva to, uh, to so-called um, overlook. So we got a chilek every time. Not every time, Amish, but many times. But we also got answers. So um, you have to weigh the two. You know, like, uh, like the story when there was the Sreif in Lubavitch and a lot of the Ksov in the manuscripts were burned. So the Tzamech Tzedek was, the Tzamech Tzedek called in a chassid and said, why didn't you steal these manuscripts? She said, steal? How could we steal? He said, and the, so the Tzamech Tzedek said, void the void Messias never of chassidus. You know, who's going to steal from the Tzemach Tzedek? But had they stolen them, they wouldn't have been burnt. <laughs> so he said, I'm all deaf, I'm all nefesh, oh, So we had a little Mesidus Nefesh. I can't say it was a Mesidus Nefesh like uh, in Stalinist uh, Soviet Union exactly. But uh, we got a chilek. I'll tell you one story about it if I may. This I've shared, but uh, not so often I'll share it with you. Um, it was Shabbos Pasha Boy, Tov Shem Vov. Shabbos Ches Shvat two days before Yud Shvat. So the Rebbe always would connect the Pasha, the, 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 not the Pasha, the Tkvirs, the day Tchesh Shvat with Yud Shvat. What's the connection? So the Rebbe said, in the Seyta, the Mesech the Seyta, it says, 
אתה יודע, בשמיינה בשבט, בחשבט, אז נסתלקו, נעשו זקנים שבדור. The skenim of the generation of Yeshua passed away that day. So I said, that's the connection, the stalkus of the Fridic Rebbe and the stalkus of the skenim. But then the Rebbe asked the question, skenim is Lashon Rabbim. Here it's a Rebbe, one Rebbe. Skenim is a many skenim. So what's the connection? Skenim is not the Rebbe. It's not Yeshua. So the Rebbe answered, it's an interesting answer. He said, the truth is that they were all like Rabbeim. So why is there only Reb, one Rebbe by us? Because we cannot uh, tolerate and contain so much light. So we could only have one Rebbe. Then they were able to, because they were a Derdeya or a generation after the Derdeya, they were able to contain more than one Rebbe, so to speak. That's what the Rebbe said. I remember by the Fabrengen, like today, I read it, we said, okay, I'm writing a settle tonight immediately. You know, to the Rebbe. What does that mean? We always learn this one Rebbe, Lamal Yusin, not because of Chsar Nador, because like you say, one Kayin Godel, like by Kairach, one Kayin Godel, one Teda, one Moshe, one Eberster. It's not Mitzad Achsad, it's Mitzad the Maila. It's one, it's an Etzem. And there's no two, there's no two. And I wrote it to them. I mean, we wrote very respectfully, like Le Tafasno was the expression we would usually use. We didn't grasp, we didn't understand. And I wrote even more that Yud Beis Thomas Tov Shechof, hey, the Rebbe himself told the story that he asked the Friedrich Rebbe what was the Tzemach Tzedek's behavior like during the time of the Mitla Rebbe? Because the Chassidim said that he behaved a little like a Rebbe, even when the Mitla Rebbe was a Rebbe. It was his father-in-law, his uncle. So the Friedrich Rebbe said, the Rebbe said in the Fabrengen, he said the Rebbe's name, his second name, Mem, he said, Vos Retzta, a Rebbe is not Einer. There's only one Rebbe, there's no two Rebbes. It's printed, the story. So I wrote to the Rebbe at the Chayre, so what's the Rebbe saying? It's not a Chassad Nadar. And then a little, uh, I guess, machshava crept into me. And you know what? Since I'm already writing, why don't I like take, go out on a limb, a little risk? I'm going to ask a sensitive question. I wrote to the Rebbe that based on what the Rebbe said, maybe with that we can explain that when Mashiach comes and all the Rabbeim will come back, who's going to be the Rebbe? Well, the Alter Rebbe, the Mitla Rebbe, looks at that Alter Rebbe as his Rebbe. Mitla Rebbe, it's a Machzadek, the Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, they'll all be here. So who's going to be the Rebbe? So maybe, according to the Rebbe, since it'll be such a big giluim, we could have many Rebbe. I knew that this was treading on very uh, <laughs> sensitive ground. Which but uh, Memvov, boy Memvov. So I decided, you know what, Mr. Snefer Shokhsidis, it was worth it. Whatever happens, happens. If we get an answer, great. If we don't get an answer, we get a chilek. Okay, I'll take the... I don't know if I showed it to him. <laughs> you wouldn't show him your questions before? Or uh, if it was a question he wouldn't oppose, I probably would show him. <laughs> um, it depends if he was around. I, I, wouldn't, I didn't hide it from him. If he was, I probably would ask him. He probably would be against it, but he, didn't, he never imposed himself. He told me many times, he said, you're writing the Fabringen, I defer to you. I can tell you my opinion. And I looked, I listened to his opinion, obviously. We had arguments. Sometimes I wrote what he wrote, what he, how he understood it. Sometimes I wrote how I understood it, to be very honest. I understand the great Rabbi El, but he's still immortal, just for the record. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, there were people by Rabbi El, like I remember there just as a joke, the people who were uh, Yale worshippers, we called them. You know, the, that I remember there was one Bachar. He wasn't the wisest guy, let's put it this way. Um, so I remember someone asked him, he said, let me ask you, who has a better Koyach Hasbara, Rabbi El or the Rebbe? And he took an answer. He said that you're asking a difficult question, you know. I mean, so you have to uh, let's 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 put this. Compared to the Rebbe, we were all equal. I respected Abiel professionally. I learned much from him. I honored him. Until this day, I have a debt of gratitude to him. But that doesn't mean I agree with everything. And we had plenty of arguments and disagreements. And um, I, 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 I definitely would defer to him in many cases. But sometimes there were different approaches. You know, what can I say? The Rebbe says, Shivim Panim Lateri, you know. Um, I'll share one story, but let me finish Let me finish with the question. So I asked the question to the Rebbe. I knew this can be a big chilek, Um and that's what happened. So the Rebbe didn't even answer most of the questions. He went straight to this question and wrote the following. Um, 
He wrote, Be'eze snif temchet mimim. Mefalpelim bedvarim dakim and adakim. Kamoiza. You all understand the answer? In what, in what branch of temchet mimim are they sitting and debating the nuances and the subtleties of such questions? Basically, you know, what, what are you kriching in places you don't belong? That's essentially what the Rebbe said. Which, you know, I have the answer and I got it, but uh, I, don't, I don't regret it. I asked, and so be it. We don't have an answer. Or maybe uh, we had a few times things like that. The Rebbe basically, I'll tell you one, actually, Rabbi Yale and Label Groner, and everybody did not want to ask the question, and I insisted and I sent it, and I didn't uh, care what they said. Tov Shinun. Sometimes when I would bring it to the to, to the Maskiris, he would look and he always had an opinion sometimes, you know. I told him, I'm not asking you, you're your secretary, you have to deliver it. But I still had a big on his good side, I didn't want to, you know. But sometimes he would have his opinions. You know, we, we had to, let's put it this way, there was always some maneuvering going on here and there. Um, uh, but I was good with them all, but sometimes, you know. Like in this case, I'll tell you what happened. It was Isra Chag Simchas Teireh Tov Shinun. So we're talking about the later years now. And the Rebbe would say Kaddish every year. The Rebbe said Kaddish, I think, four or five times a year. I remember already. Besides the famous Yud Shvat, Chofov, and Vav Tishrei. Um, and then later, Chav uh, Beishvat. But like he said, Isra Chag Simchas Teireh, I think Yud Kislev. And they say that was for his brother, Beryl. Um, and of course, I think uh, Yud Gimel uh, Ir, for his bro- also his brother. But, but we didn't know why he said Kaddish Yisra Chag Simchas There was speculation, but no one knew why. Didn't dam for the Ahmed. After the, the Kaddish Yosem. That year, the Rebbe also spoke a Sicha. The whole Sicha was Shlesha Trisin, the Mishnayis of a Yorzeit. From beginning to end, the whole thing was an explanation of Mishnayis of And now, we're preparing a whole Sicha in a Yorzeit, the Rebbe saying Kaddish. So, and it was a very complicated, very deep Sicha about Dira Ptachtenim and all the time Abriya. So I thought, you know, for the Shlema Se'inyan, I published a Sicha, Yartzeit, who's Yartzeit is? So I asked Label Groner, I said, do you mind asking the Rebbe? He said, no, I'm not asking the Rebbe such a thing. All the years we didn't know who it is, I'm not asking the Rebbe such a thing. The Rebbe wants us to know, he'll tell us. That was his approach. So I thought what to do, so I said, you know what? I'm, I have a bunch of questions on the Sicha anyway. You know, just that question, I wouldn't just send him one question. But since I have a bunch of questions... I'll ask the questions, and then I'll write, very respectfully, L'shleim ha'se'inyan, the te'el ha'salem dim I wrote, U'lai k'day l'hesif, alo yadu alonu. You know, we looked and we couldn't find whose yard side it is. U'lai, the te'el ha'salem dim, the Rebbe could, I don't know, I forget the Lushen, could add, you know, whose yard side. I wrote it very uh, neutrally. The Rebbe could easily have ignored it. Or if he wants to add, he would. I, I thought it was a professional a question. It's not like, what's the chutzpah here? I'm not telling the Rebbe he has to tell us the secret. I remember when Label saw it, he said, how could you write such a thing? I said, I'm writing it, not you. I'm, I'm responsible for publishing the sikhs. It's a professional que- question. Rabbi El also told me, he says, I don't think you should write it. But nobody, no, listen, nobody, I, I, had, I had a day here. It wasn't like, and I didn't accept what they, 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 they were. I said, listen, if I get a chilek, I'm going to get the chilek. You're not getting a chilek. What do you want? And what am I doing already? And that happens, happens at, at ended up being actually the biggest bracha. Everybody thanked me afterwards. Because the Rebbe wrote a whole ha'ara that's printed. He wrote, he wrote, the Yartzeit shall imi ziknesi rochel Hashem yinkam doma, the mother of his mother. Rebbe Tzachana's mother, his name was Rochel. She was killed, Hashem yinkam doma. And the Rebbe even added, why is he saying Kaddish for her? He wrote, be Tipla be bin Nikolaev. She he would spend time in Nikolaev by her, and she took care of him. So I mean, even without that, he could say Kaddish for his grandmother, especially if she was killed by the Nazis. But he actually routes that. So we have also a little piece of history. And, and then I remember Label said, "Oh, so Baruch Hashem, you wrote." <laughs> no, I, I I didn't need his askama. It, it could have gotten a chel. Rebbe could have also given a chelik, or he could have ignored it. But I thought, like that case, I have no. No, I have no mis- question marks at all. What, what, what should we ask or not? You know, the Rebbe said a whole sikh on the yard site. It makes total sense to ask. And so we, the heart is printed, and we have that piece of history. Just for the record, the Rebbe wrote to me on the side, 
not to print, not to print. That loya dua bit bidiuk yem ha yartzeit. Because remember, the Nazis, Yimach Shemom, they killed wantonly Jews, and they no one knew exactly. That's why a lot of yartzeits are like the day after Yontif. Because they had the, sad, the sadism, they killed Jews dafke yam tevim mostly. Shavuos, Pesach, Sukkis. You know, that was part of their, their animalistic uh, behavior. So they knew more or less that people were killed, but no one knew exactly when. So the Rebbe wrote, Lo yadu alonu bediuk. I forgot the exact lotion. Like he almost like was asking me to go be mavader. And he said to be mavader in Pinkasois. Pinkasois are like uh, journals that were written up in the Shtetlach. How do you translate a Pinkas? Yeah, like a type of like a town record. Ledger. Yeah, ledger. And uh, and as well as to go to Mishpacha Sianovsky, because that's the Mishpacha of the Rebetzin, Chana. Bastralia Oid. So I felt like Mamish, like a personal request that the Rebbe wants to, if we can figure out when exactly is the yard site. I can tell, I, 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 I didn't leave any stone unturned. I was making phone calls. I got Kazaminsky on the case. I don't know if you know Kazaminsky was like the resident in-house scholar or researcher. They say he comes from the time of the Alter Rebbe. Um, I remember Kazaminsky, yeah. And I got everybody involved. We were calling and calling. I called the Yanovskis. I called this one, that one. Spent a good three weeks. And I was like, you know, really, I thought if I could write to the Rebbe, we find. And we found out, you know, we, the, 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 she was killed in Nikolaev, that's for sure. But we can't know exactly because the Nazis were like, going through Ukraine then like big time. And they were mamish wiping out the Jewish population day after day. So we know what day they went into Nikolaev, but it was a few days. And there are no eyewitnesses because almost everybody was killed. There's no documentation. It was around Sukkot? Yeah, it was definitely around Sukkot's time. We know for sure. We know the period when the Nazis came there. Also, Lubavitch, they came. They, 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 this was Babi Yar. This was Ukraine. You know what kind of massacres they did there? Shootings. It was all shootings. It was not uh, uh, concentration camps. They were just shooting thousands and thousands of Jews. It was Shreklach. Huh? Yeah. Would that be what would save them? Would that be what would save them? in... It's possible. It's possible. Yeah, most likely. Yeah, because anyone there, it was, it was uh, the, the game over. All right, um, I, I have many more questions, just, but now we're going to open it up. To yeah. the I just want to say this. So then I wrote back to the Rebbe. I was mamish. I, I remember I, I couldn't stand writing to the Rebbe this. I wrote, we worked, they checked on this, and we could not find. The Rebbe wrote, I think, in the Skabal of a or something. Um, but I really wanted to, like, finish that. I still, I still, by the way, keep my eyes on. Every time I meet a researcher, it's not, you know, maybe today they find new documents. I still feel like a chayv, and maybe we could still find it. So you know, we'd have it for the record at least. But it was not just her; it was anyone that was killed in that uh, that region. So if anybody, by the way, you ever hear it from somebody? No, seriously. Today there are documents that are found today that were not found before. So maybe, you know, there are things that, uh, you know, especially now there's a lot of research. In basements, you find, I'm sorry, I'm just find a, a note. You know, I know, I'm just as an aside, when the Rebbets in Shena and Mendel Harnstein were killed in Treblinka, so the Rebbe writes a whole uh, a whole ha'ara, uh, like uh, in the Pesach Dover, one of the Maimorim of the Friedrich Rebbe, that there was a witness, and he gave all the details. The Rebbe wrote out all the details about when they were killed and how they were killed. You're familiar, right, with that? So it was very uh, important to know this. So there you have a little, okay, we'll open it. And the question is, what the what language was the Rebbe speak and what language was it written? So from day one, as you know, the Alter Rebbe writes in Tanya, in the Geras HaKedish, that the Baal Tov spoke in Yiddish, Losh in Yiddish. And all the Rebbeim spoke in Yiddish. Even the Maimorim that were later written in Hebrew, they were all spoken in Yiddish. That's why you'll find sometimes my modern in Yiddish from other rabbim as well. And sometimes even in a Maimon in Hebrew, you'll see a Rebbe will write be Yiddish. You know, but so we call jargon. Or, so the Rebbe spoke in Yiddish exclusively. There were a few sikhs, one in Hebrew to the Mitzioni Yisrael. There was a sikh in Russian, in French even. But these were very rare. The Rebbe spoke in Yiddish. So Hanochas were always written in Yiddish. Lukutis sikhs was written in Yiddish. Sometimes the Manichim out of just because of Kitzur, would write a Hanukkah, you know, even in Tav Shechav Aleph, you'll find many Hanukkahs in Hebrew, 
But that was just simply because Hebrew is a shorter, concise language. Um, as the years passed, obviously the community in Israel grew, the Bnei Teira grew. So in Lamed Gimel and Lamed Dalet, Lekut Tzichas came out in Hebrew. The Rebbe was actually not happy with the signet in the Hebrew, so that went back to Yiddish. But Anochis were always written in Yiddish by Rabbi El from the early years, and throughout our years we always wrote in Yiddish. In Tovshin Mem Beis, or Mem Gimel Mem Beis, um, I mentioned before that David Thalman came back from a lot, and he began Vad Anochis Belahak. The goal there was really to write Anochis, the notion case for those that don't understand Yiddish. That was the objective. So then Hanukkah started coming out, Yiddish. I continued working, I would work always in Yiddish. I wrote some Hanukkah in Hebrew also, some Sichas, more Lamdish Sichas were written in Hebrew because of more Sigan and Hatera. But the primary, the bulk of Hanukkah were in Yiddish. Lahak wrote only in Hebrew, that was the whole purpose. Lakut Sichas went back to Hebrew, what year? Mem Ches, Mem Zayin. So in the later years, the last volumes of Likud Sikhs went back to Hebrew for the same reason. It was more the Lushan uh, the, of Nei Teira, basically. Now, in Sikhs you have everything. Like, for example, Kuntus Yon Shoter Sachsidis is written in Hebrew because it's more of like a classic, uh, you know, for learning purposes. The Hadron and Rambam Lamed Hay is in Hebrew. You have the things that were printed in Apardis and Hamoyer. These were Sikhs of the Rebbe, Nigla or Chsidis, were printed in some of these Teira journals. You, they were all in Hebrew, because that was the Teda language. That was the, the story. So you have Anochis now, both in Yiddish and Hebrew, going basically from Membe. Now, after Gimel Tamas, Lahak has been publishing everything in Hebrew from the early years. So you ha- soon, you know, they'll soon have everything in Hebrew, uh, but and the rest is, and, and you have simultaneously everything in Yiddish. You can compare, there are differences. You know, one is obviously closer to the Rebbe's actual Loshan, the other one is, is Hebrew. Um, but, you know, you'll see from time to time you have to write a word in Yiddish because certain words Hebrew just doesn't uh, fully capture. Um, the Rebbe's letters, Mechtom Kolim, were in Yiddish, translated to Hebrew for the Israeli media, and for Israelis. Um, so the Rebbe's letters always were in Yiddish. I mean the Mechtom Kolim, Rosh Hashanah letters and and uh, Pesach letters. But then in Igrus Kedish, you have letters in Yiddish, you have letters in Hebrew, we know there's also letters in English. Just for the record, Sichas in English began in 1978. Yena Afsen, son took over. So that's Sichas in English. That's translated into English. I will just add for the record, when the fax machines started coming out, which was around 1985, 86, we were then, there was, there was a period in our office where we literally were publishing every Hanukkah in 14 languages. I'm not exaggerating. We had Bochum from Argentina, they did it in Spanish. We had French, we had Portuguese, Italian, Russian, even Persian. You may see in 770 sometimes there's a pages in Arab in, per, in Persian. And other languages, Dutch, I'm trying to remember all the other languages. Yeah, it was very, uh, all Sunday, the Bochum of different countries were writing the Hanukkahs. Short, shorter versions, summaries, and they were being faxed. Remember, fax changed a lot more than you could imagine. Because fax was the first time you can get a full p- printed sikha quickly. Before that, it had to go by mail. We're not talking by, by phone. A chazara by phone is, you know, it's not. But a printed document, if we mailed out the Hanoche, let's say, on Thursday or Wednesday, it didn't get to people to laugh the Shabbos. So in Israel or Australia or in France or, or England, they didn't have the Hanoche until a week later. Um, fax, as soon as it was, it was uh, written, you could fax it. And this we're talking before digital, before email, and and what would come later. So the faxes in the 80s changed things. Not only that, um, we then started writing the Teichen Kotzer, and then came the Rad, and the Nukudas. I mean, you have a bunch of summaries that were all done Saturday night, Mitzvah Shabbos, so people should get immediately a short version. Sunday, people already had all over the world by fax uh, a summary. And the Rebbe, I will tell you, people don't know this, I can tell you, the Rebbe changed some signal in how he spoke. Like usually the Rebbe's directives, he knew wouldn't get to other countries for a week later. But then when the Rebbe knew that it was being faxed, he started giving directives that I knew were for Israel or other countries right away because he knew they would get the message. So, the, I mean, subtle difference. It wasn't uh, very ba- ba- blatant, but the Rebbe definitely recognized that and uh, therefore used the, used the technology.
another. He, the Rebbe was terribly upset when we did verbatim. I'll tell you how I wrote. I think it was Boitov Shemem. And the Rebbe wrote that it was, was started being my Giyot. And I didn't write it for Hagar. I wrote it like, you know, and the Rebbe wrote on top, Hanoche milulis mamish kamoi hatape. Now everybody thinks that's a compliment because it's Shabbos. But the Rebbe was saying it's word for word, mamish like the tape, and it's not for publishing. Remember, the spoken word is not really for publishing. Except if you have, let's say, the Havdal presidents who read a speech. But someone like the Rebbe was the opposite. He spoke, and then we're writing it down. If you write it word for word, it's not readable, really. Remember, the Rebbe didn't, write in pa- didn't speak in paragraphs. No periods, no commas. So everything has to be structured. And uh, no, the Rebbe was, the Rebbe gave, I have, I have many directives. That was part of, you share with them. I have directives from the Rebbe directly writing how to organize a sicha, how not to make it literal, not verbatim. Verbatim is good, you know, I mean, for somebody who's a mekusher to like these guys that print out the crazy, uh, you know, what are they called? Medayik b'maymer. You know, every cough. And the Rebbe uh, says, Bo'osi, they'll write, Be'ez Aleph, Be'ez Aleph. I mean, that's a little insane. I understand it goes with the klal, Shechinim Adaberes Mitech Greine. But, uh, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu was Kvad Peh, but the Teir is pretty, uh, there's no, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but the Teir doesn't have any stutters in it uh, or coughs, you know. Even though, what's it, what's it? even though Chonyi Marozov, who was a famous chazer, they said that uh, that when he became, when the Rebbe Friedrich Rebbe was his chaver, so they said they didn't have the same iskashers to the Friedrich Rebbe as he had to the Rebbe Rashab. And, uh, and, he said, <coughs> and he said it's true. It's good you cough because that's the story. Because he said that the Rebbe Rashab, when he was chazer, he was chazer also the coughs. And Friedrich Rebbe, he missed a few coughs. So it means the iskashers wasn't perfect. Um, so, I mean, that, that's a little nutty, and uh, definitely the Rebbe would not accept something. I, I know Sikhs, the Rebbe started editing and then stopped because he said it's not written, it's not the written word, it's the spoken word. Spoken and written are two different worlds. I mean, you have to be a writer to see that. It's just not, you just can't do it that way. And writing, in general, writing, for example, the Rebbe has it over something 10 minutes later. You can't just, you have to sometimes organize it and make it more like a one, one, um, one, uh, what's the word? One cohesive uh, piece, etc. Yes, we did. Of course, we got the first computer in uh, Lubavitch, by the way, if it's of claim to fame. Um, in Tovshin Mem Dalad, the first PC, which is from, um, um, from IBM, came out, I think, in 85, if I'm correct, or 84. But before that, there was, you may have heard of Commodore. These were names. We got what was called a... Uh, um, uh, it was a uh, what was it called? Uh, it was the name of a company. It doesn't exist anymore. Computers then, I don't know if you know this, didn't have a keyboard and a screen. It was all one, one body. It was a green screen with a typewriter in built in. I still have the original one that I used, and um, and it was, still works by the way. Five meg of memory. And it you know boots up with a big big it's it's a it's a machine but like I whenever it's like a museum piece, I have it I have it in my office, I whenever I show it to people I say this thing has more chassidus than all of us in it you know so don't uh, don't dismiss it, um, so we got it, and we asked we got Bettel Weiss, gave us twenty thousand dollars, for two computers each computer cost five thousand dollars five meg of memory I mean less than a, than a calculator. Um, and then we needed to also buy a, t- a printer. Then it was not yet digital. It was what's called inkjet, you know, you know, which meant it would spray ink eight times. It would go back and forth on the same line eight times, spray ink, and we had to design Hebrew fonts, which was another 5,000. So it was five, 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 t- 20,000. We wrote to the Rebbe and explained it would save around a day because you didn't have to retype. That was the main chiddush. No, f- first there was a linotype that was with, with with lead. That's why it's called typeset. They would actually set type with lead. They would engrave letters in re- lead. It was big, big machines. They looked like trains, you know. Then they c- went to cold type. That was the beginning of digital, ultimately. Those were the years, the 70s, the late 70s and 80s. Everyone went to a printer then. There was no such thing as having a digital pr- uh, 
a laser printer. Laser printers didn't exist. That didn't exist till the mid 80s. I remember we grew with it. I always wanted to use technology because it would save around a day because we didn't have to retype. That was the chiddush of a word processor. Once you type it, you could edit it as many times as you like and you don't have to retype. I know it sounds weird, but you had to retype. And how do you put numbers in? We had a guy with, 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 with wax, with little numbers and a, uh, and a uh, razor blade sticking numbers, like, you know, these superscript numbers. You have to do it all manually. And if there was a mistake, there was a thing called whiteout. You had to white it out and retype over it. And if a paragraph was, for, was cut, was forgotten, instead of retyping the whole thing, we had to cut. Don't ask. It was a, but you do it. You do what you had to do. How was accounting done before computers? Handwritten, you know, writing, you know, the good old-fashioned way. So we wrote to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe wrote back, why two computers? So I wrote because I need one to type the original. And meanwhile, the other guy can work simultaneously. So the Rebbe wrote, yes. Um, and that was the Askama we got. And that was that. Why did you feel you needed to get permission? You know, we worked in the Sikhs, and we felt we didn't want to do anything without the Rebbe's uh, Askama or Bracha. Also, the letters would have changed. The Rebbe would see. It was a different type. It used to be typewriters, typewritten letters. And the Rebbe, the Rebbe actually chose the font. We showed the Rebbe three, four fonts. We asked him which one he wants. And he chose. We tried to copy. Frank Rule was the was the real font that was always used in Svarim. Even that's not t today the same. Like if you look at Sefer Erchim, the original, you'll see it's more it's it's classier. The old fonts actually were classier than the new ones. I mean, it's easier today. You know, it's almost a, it's 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 a, it's like a no brainer. It's changed completely. But we as the Rebbe chose the font. And then I remember once we, by mistake, did a different font, and the Rebbe sent it out and says, it can't be read, you can redo it. So we redid it, you know. You had a group of, like, the Kiyam and all of, like, Torah? Or, I mean, not a, one person, out of, <laughs> but, like, how did you know where to even look? Let's say Amar and Mokim, how did you know? Very good know? question. It's a good question. Um, well, let's put it this way. None of us could do this without, <laughs> without some measure of Kiyas. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to speak about myself, but yes, I had a little bit keys. It's not just about uh, writing from memory. You have to now look up a Maimar Chazal and, and compare, you know, not only that. I mean, I could tell you, I didn't start writing the Anoche, actually typing, until Sunday late afternoon. What did I do all Sunday? I was researching. Because after the Chazara, we had the Rebbe's points. But now we had to look up. Like, for example, the Rebbe, let's say, spoke about something, and then you found in Torah Er, ah, that's what the Rebbe was talking about. Or you found a Zoya. The Rebbe didn't always quote and say, I'm quoting from here. The Rebbe was like a walking uh, encyclopedia. But then you can have some Rishin that, that not I'll, even so, prints, you know, so, so hold on, so let, so let me tell you. I'm at, so, I'm at, so first of all, all of us had to have a, a measure of Pekias. Um When there was a topic that we had people we showed it to, like for example, when I would write the Anoche, I would give it to three, four people to look over. One was a Baal Nigla, one was a Baal Chassidus. Um, when we had a particular question, there were people who were very good in Rashi, people who were Rashi Sikhs. You know, there were people like Melech Tzvibel, for example, or Big Boki, Bechlal, and Teda, um, and others. And, uh, and we try to give it to a few people like that. Now, excuse me, Yovin, I'm sure there are things we may have missed. We may still have things that the Rebbe quoted that we maybe have never, you know, but the Rebbe, generally speaking, there weren't many obscure sugyas that we couldn't find. You know, someone who knows their stuff doesn't mean they know it all, but you know how to find it. So one thing leads, like a detective, uh, it's like you start looking at a Maimah Chazal, so then you look at the Magbilis, you know, you look in the, the different Svarim that say, and like, you know, uh, tell the Sadden, that tell you where all, all these Psukim are brought. So it's not that difficult if you know what you're doing. Like today, I don't even really use Google or Eitzah Chachma. I do. I go back to my old because I'm, it's faster for me to find it through Svarim, honestly, because I know the I, I've done it so many years. Now, obviously, for someone who doesn't know anything, they just type in a, a, a phrase in Eitzah Chachma and things pop up. But it's also Amaratzis. You can also have uh, a, th a thousand things pop up until you find what you're looking for. I'm not saying you can't find it. I sometimes use Google Hebrew for a phrase. But for things that are more sugyas, I'll use my own uh, approach. Tzamech by the way, I don't know if you ever look at the Sefer Lekutim, 
which I worked on before I worked in Sichas, is a tremendous resource of finding almost anything you need. Because it's some Tzedek's Bikiyas is Lahafli. So you bring a Posik, he'll bring you everything. My Mare Chazal, Rishenim, Achrenim, Chkira, Musar, you got it. Kuzri, Mare Nevuchim. So there are, you know, methods of finding one thing leads to another. And today it's a lot easier. I mean, you know, obviously Encyclopedia Talmud, this is a very valuable uh, resource. Teir Shlema. These are, by the way, Svarim that Rebbe had in his room. You could see it. He used it all the time. So the Rebbe was a big user of, the, of encyclopedias. Teir Shlema. You have any Maim Chazal, any Pasuk, uh, Encyclopedia Talmudis, um, and, and so on, you know. Um, but there's a way, you know, once you know your way, it's like navigating. You, lo- you know how to navigate. I remember once the Rebbe wrote Miut um, Rabim Shnaim. So, and he wrote, he wrote a, 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 a mark to find the Maramokim, the source. Look it up. You're not going to find a source so easily. The Gemara says, Miyat Rab Mishlesha. So what do you do? Um, actually, look, look it up even in Google. You're not going to find it. You'll find it in the Sikha, I think. So we were looking and looking and looking. There we finally, I wrote to the Rebbe, Chapasnu, Chipasnu, Leimatsanu, Leisato. Ten minutes later, I remember Leibu Grona calling. He was so excited. The Rebbe wrote out a whole bunch of Armin Kamis. And they were all obscure ones. Like a like a like um like a Maraponim on the Rishalmi somewhere, some Pirush on uh, Tesefta. It wasn't original. It was commentaries on Chazal, which was that. That's a tremendous biki. Now it's very likely the Rebbe had it already written down, and found it somewhere else, and he just found it as a Shima. I'm not saying it's purely from his memory, but at some point the Rebbe did the research and he sent it out. So there were things like that. I have around twenty twenty five untied knots, so to speak, that the Rebbe wrote to us that I never found a Maramokum for. So if you ever want to do a little research, I can give them to you, and I'm, I still look for it time to time. You know, you look through things, you have it always in mind, like, will I find it? I remember quite a few things like that, that uh, the Rebbe once wrote, that, Korov Levadei Shezeo Bereshimoisai. And when the Rishimus came out, I thought it would be there, and it was not there. So which tells me there may be other Rishimus we don't have. So there are things that Rebbe wrote to us that we never really found. And there were some Hanochas we didn't even print because we couldn't write the Hanoche without... I mean, I can give you examples if you want, but um, again, I don't know how much I should elaborate. You probably have more questions, right? Yeah, you give you an example of Hanoche you didn't print. Didn't now, now it's all printed because we print now, even, you know, everything was printed. So Mishpatim Tov Shin Mem. Was it Mishpatim or Yisrei? Mishpatim Tov Shin Mem. The Rebbe said the following. There's a there's a Maimar Chazal, Eina Deima Shmi Aliria. Okay, we know famous expressions. Rashi brings it in Yisrael. And the Rebbe said, You could do that I have them. If in Yisrael, that Yisrael said, Vayishma Yisrael, even though Vayishma, but till he came and saw with his own eyes, because Yisrael Amsuf, Ati Yadaiti, Ki Godl Havai Mikola Lakim. Why Ata? Because now he saw it. Shmir was not enough. So it's a raya. So the Rebbe says, why do we need a raya from Yisrael? There are other rayas. By, by Martin Taylor, there's a bunch of rayas. And the Rebbe's answer was unbelievable. He said, because Yisrael was a chacham, was one of the biggest chachamim. So if it was Tam a person who says, until I see it, okay, but here's a person who's a real chacham. So Shmir should be enough, because he understands things. And still by him, Ria is stronger, so it's a real raya. In other words, it's, uh, from, a, from a fool, it's not an eye. So a fool sees something, right? That was the Rebbe's. Now, this is all predicated that there's a raya from Yisrael, or else the whole piece doesn't make sense. And so I thought, oh, look at Medrash, I'm sure it says Yisrael. I look at Mechilta, all the places, all the regular sources. He's not mentioned, even though it's in Pasha Yisrael. But, it but, but it's not Yisrael himself. And, and based on that, well, you can't ask a question that the Raya from Yisrael, and then where's the Raya from Yisrael? So we looked and looked and looked. I went through, I can't tell you, I went through all of my modem in, in uh, Tofresh, um, I think Lamet, not Lamet, uh, one of the, my modem of the, of the, of the Reb Marash, I think maybe Vehechrim, Lamet Aleph. He talks a lot about Ri and Shmir. 
And I remember going through the pages, and I was every time I saw it, I said, oh, maybe here it just has to mention you. said, that's all we need. You need one place. that <laughs> Couldn't find it. So I wrote back to the Rebbe. And that's what the Rebbe wrote, Karav Levadei Shemaisai. And I, so uh, at the time I asked Abel, I asked people, are there Shimas? I mean, I knew that we knew there were Shimas from the Rebbe, but that, no one was going to show them to us. And also, I don't even know if Label had a right to, you know, it was by the Rebbe in his private uh, drawer. So, so that was it. Then when the Shimas started getting printed, I thought maybe uh, it's going to pop up. It didn't. So it's still hanging, I still in my mind, somewhere. That's an example. So that whole sikha is not in the Hanukkah. No, it's in the Hanukkah now. And it doesn't say Maramakim, it just says Raya for you today. Then we didn't want to print it because people would ask. So now you'll see Mishpatim that the sikha is printed. But we, we didn't print it officially that week because we were still looking for it. So it's there. I mean, again, uh, the, the, it, I'm sure it's somewhere in a safer. How did you keep yourself healthy? <laughs> or, all Who says work. I'm healthy? <laughs> I mean, enough, at least for by the end of the week, you actually okay. came out with Anukha. So let's say, all Mata Shabbos, you were up, breaking your head to come, then the next day, the next day, the next day. Now you're already getting into very uh, sensitive matters. Um, we lived, I lived on, uh, basically, on, uh, on the fumes, as they say, on adrenaline. That was a big force in my life. It kept me healthy. I always felt that I'm doing the Rebbe's work, and if I keep stick to it, I'll be fine. Yes, I learned then to almost not sleep. I sleep very even till today. I'm a very sleep only very few hours, and uh, sleep and memory don't go well together. Just for the record, um, and I learned a lot of you know, <coughs> adrenaline is the right word. You build this, you build up stamina. I mean, maybe God also blessed me with some stamina, but definitely the work. The pressure I can never even describe. I, I'll be very honest. At times I really thought, I don't know how I can continue on. Sometimes it was so difficult. I remember times I used to walk in the office, almost want to bang my head in the wall because either the sikh was too difficult, we forgot pieces. You know, it was just, it was extremely, extremely difficult. It's hard to even imagine. But you know, the, the Rebbe always says, Einam avakashel lefikecha. I guess because we had the responsibility, we were given the keiches. I can't really explain it completely. I think what it teaches you that when you really, really put your mind to something, you can achieve things that can seem impossible. I even think the remembering that we remember. I have a good memory. I definitely have a gift. But to that extent, it was the pressure. It was also the sense of urgency. Like for me, I really believe this in my deepest heart. That the Rebbe Moshe Rabbein was coming down from Hasinai, the Fabrengen, and either you remember what he said and write it down, or it's forever lost. I used to feel that way every week. I felt the, 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 that pressure that if you don't do it, it will be forever lost and we'll never know what the Rebbe said. To me, that was like the worst possible thing. That's like, you know, the Rebbe spoke and you don't remember what he. And you know, we have Fabrengens, by the way. My modern, we don't even know. We know more the names of my Marim of the Alter Rebbe than we know from Tov Shechov Gimel Chov Dalet. There are my Marim, we don't even know the Dibra Maschel. It's like tragic. So I felt that that definitely, when you have a sense of urgency like that, it's not optional. It's not like, you know, I'll try. If it doesn't work out, I'll do something else. That definitely fed. I mean, I'll share a story about it. You talk about adrenaline. And it's not a, I meant it seriously. When I was a, uh, a teenager, I had allergies. You know, summer, the ragweed, called hay fever. And if you have that miserable, uh, it went away when I got older, thank God. It was not life-threatening, but it was the beautiful summer day, mid-August and September, forget about it. Your nose doesn't stop running, your eyes don't stop itching, your throat is tickling, uh, right, sneezing. It's a pain in the butt. The nicer the day, the worse is you're going to be your life that day. Okay. One, I remember one summer, I, I had such a bad... I had an asthma attack. I couldn't breathe. So that they, they rushed me to a not hospital. They brought, uh, it, was in, it was an infirmary in the camp in Detroit. And they, they put something, my thing, which opened up your, like the channels. So I was able to breathe, fine. After the summer, I went right to a Dr. Redner, a famous allergist in Brooklyn. And, uh, you know, they do the tests. They, they, they was a scratch tests. So he did uh, ragweed, dust, some other things. And the pollen of those two blew up. 
I had a very severe reaction in his office because I was very sensitive. I was very like a very low tolerance. Um, and I right away had a big another attack. I really couldn't breathe. So he came and injected me with something, and uh, suddenly everything cleared up. It was like Ganadin. I couldn't believe it. I said, so what are you doing with all this stuff? Just inject me. He said, this is adrenaline. Epipen. Adrenaline, and if you keep injecting, you're going to build up tolerance, and then it gets very dangerous. Adrenaline is not something you want to play with. It's like it's, it's a very powerful uh, a drug. So I said, is that the adrenaline that we talk about when you get excited? You know, when we get excited, adrenaline runs through you? He said, yeah. And I said, can I ask you something? You know, I have this allergies, but every time Sunday... I don't feel these allergies. And I'm very busy. That's my biggest, most pressure day because I'm writing the, the Febringens and I don't feel it. So I always thought I was so busy I didn't even notice my nose is running. But I really don't feel any allergies. So he said to me, absolutely. When your adrenaline is flowing, you have a superhuman control over yourself. This is what he told me. He said, you ever see opera singers, pianists, concert pianists, uh, actors in Broadway? They never sneeze and they never yawn. How could they four hours go without a sneeze? Sneeze is a natural thing. You can't control a sneeze. He says, because when your adrenaline is flowing, you have more than normal control over your body. That's why if you set your mind to wake up 6 o'clock in the morning, you don't need any alarm clock. You wake up exactly 6, which is a fact. If you really set your mind, it has to be like very important to you. So I said to myself, one second, here's a chemical called adrenaline, and when it's really rushing through your body, it pushes it physically has gives you a healthy you know you can be more immune i mean i'm answering your question i have no doubt it's part of that i think people who have a sense of urgency in life and like they know they must do it it's not like today we have oh it's optional maybe today i'll do it tomorrow there's always you know we we we, we have no uh no, no emergencies which is a blessing but it also can be creates a you know i have to tell a joke um if i may you know the guy was sitting on a bench and he's all very upset, old Jew. His friend comes over to him and says to him, what are you so depressed about? He said, my wife is very angry at me. What happened? He said, she's very angry. She's always angry at you. What's, so, what's the big thing? He said, no, today's something special. This morning, she went to work. and She asked me what I'm going to do today. So I said, nothing. She said, you said that yesterday. So I told her I wasn't finished. <laughs> okay, so there's the art of doing nothing. And that is, that's the opposite of adrenaline. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Can you talk for a minute about the sikhs that you didn't put to writing because maybe they were too sharp or something like that? Yeah, of course. Um, you'll find in Hanukkah uh, sometimes the word chaser, sometimes chaser ktsas. Um, those are usually uh, lines or words that Rebbe said very sharp about himself which we just didn't feel comfortable to write, or it was something about a person or a moised that we knew the Rebbe wouldn't want to be publicized. In most cases, we had our own common sense to know that. There were instances where the Rebbe made it very clear we shouldn't publish something. Can you give us some examples? Yeah, I will, I will. Oh, these were always Shabbos? These were always Shabbos? Not always. There are sikhs like yud based Thomas Chavches. You'll see a whole sikhs chasa there about when they try to you know, put a microphone in the Rebbe's room. It's on a tape, I'm sure, but maybe the tape is also, I don't know. <laughs> so, so, well, let me say, I, I, I didn't finish. I, di I didn't finish. Hey, my friends, I didn't finish the story. So, so in the official Anochis, you're going to find Chaser, or Chaser Ktsas, and sometimes the whole Sikh is not there, and we might not even write Chaser. Um, uh, I'll give examples in a moment. I, between us, I wrote everything. But then I would tell, make sure that the one who's typing it didn't type that, so it didn't get published. So I kept for myself what has been known as ashmatis. Now those ashmatis have already been smuggled out, so people have that. I think it's on Rebbe Drive even, frankly, or other places. Um, it still needs to be done, used with discretion, you know, frankly, even the Rishimis of the Rebbe, there are pieces that were not published because they're very sharp, very personal. And, and we had discretion. Um, um, it, was, I, it was, in most cases, pretty self-understood what you shouldn't publish. You know, to give an example, I'm, I, I didn't even want to say it because that's the reason we didn't publish, but I'll just give an example. 
The Rebbe sometimes would speak about himself quite critically. Like he would bring, as the Maimar Chazal says, that someone, you know, someone that doesn't have Yiddish Shemayim, that's why you don't listen to him. So since people are not listening to the Rebbe, that means he doesn't have Yiddish Shemayim. We didn't think it's appropriate to write that. Udn in the Loi Shaman. You know, it says, someone that doesn't... Uh, so things like that we would not publish, where the Rebbe would speak harshly about himself, about why he's uh, d- why is he even coming out of and it's a waste of time. The Rebbe never so pushed some, back at that? Huh? The Rebbe never pushed back at you to print it? That for sure not. If anything, we probably printed some things the Rebbe wouldn't have been so happy about. You know, no, the Rebbe never commented on this yeah, at all. He said it's not repeated. Huh? As if he said it's not repeated. The Rebbe did write to me once, Loi kol ma nidbar, kedish, he for sure wrote that more than once. I got that settled once. Meaning sometimes, for example, the Rebbe would uh, be very sharp. I'll give you an example. Um, people criticize, let's say, Mifza Neshek. Light, little girl should light. It's a minig of a saint. be a denu, a new minig. What is this? And the Rebbe would sometimes respond sharply, like saying, and, the, and your grandmother's read newspapers. If minig, you know. So since there's more cheshach, we need more air. In other words, only you go back to the past with mitzvahs. What about all the negative things that you're doing? So a thing like that, if we wrote that, once I wrote it in the sicha, and the Rebbe wrote back, how many people are going to start lighting Shabbos candles if they read that? In other words, the Rebbe said it in a fabrengen of the record to know the fact. But but, but Rebbe also was practical. It's, uh, such a line is not going to necessarily be makar of someone. It's like, it's, it's like someone's going to go. So this you need to have seichel. You know, this comes down to things even like Mashiach. There are a lot of things that are true. doesn't mean you have to go say it everywhere because it's not necessarily who just told me the story. But it's not a Pella. Someone was saying over, someone, the Rebbe sent him on a shlichus to go to, I think, Rabbi Soloveitchik or someone, one of the, not Chabad Rabbonim. And he said to the Rebbe, should I say it in the Rebbe's name or not? So the Rebbe answered, whatever the Tayelis is. If it helps, say my name. If it doesn't help, don't say my name. It's, it's idiots that don't understand this. So this is because you have to be practical. What is going to work? I mean, I know from a communicator myself, if I get up and say to audiences who don't know what a Parsha is, it says and we speaks Parsha, what did I do wrong? But they don't know what a Parsha is. And I lose them as soon as I say that. Now, I'm not even talking about controversial. Communication is, is know who you're speaking to. You know, it's like with the mental foot of us said, Be'ite bismane. You know, like, so someone asked him, what he had a bracha from the Friedrich Rebbe, that whatever he says should be So they asked him, what does that mean? He says, it means like this. If you tell someone good morning in the morning, that's be'ite. If you tell him good morning in the evening, that's not be'ite. <laughs> What's be'ite? If you tell someone good morning when you meet him in the morning, that's good. If he's in the bathroom and you say good morning, that's not be'ite. You know, you don't say good morning to someone behind the... So... It's a matter of common sense, of understanding that the c- communication is what, it's not what you say, it's how you say it, to who's your audience. You don't speak to a five-year-old like you speak to a 20-year-old. So this was a klal throughout. Um, so that we had to use our discretion. Another example was in the year Nun Aleph, Boy Nun Aleph. So that was the war, the, the Iraq war, the Persian Gulf War. And the Rebbe then spoke in the Sikha that Saddam was saying, yes, Emrim, that he was killed. And the Rebbe spoke about the Botsra and the, the, the killing of... of of, of the enemy, etc., in Pasha Boy, like Pare, etc. Then was discovered he wasn't killed. So he asked the Rebbe, or I think we didn't even ask the Rebbe, maybe the Rebbe gave a hero. I got a call, I think, from Rabbi Groner. It could be we asked, or we didn't ask, I don't remember. We didn't ask in writing, we definitely didn't ask in writing, but it was very clear that Rebbe said not to print the Sikha. Why? Because it didn't happen yet. Even though it did happen later, and the Rebbe did say, Eid Chazayin Lemayit that you know, time will tell. So that was an example, that there was a clear error not to print it. Um, there were times that what we would call a plitas hapeh, which is also contrary, the Rebbe sometimes said something like, the chofches nisen sicha, the Rebbe kept saying chofches la'emer, I think. So there they corrected it. Now, for those that are wondering, how could the Rebbe shechinim and deberes metergreine? I'm sure you can start finding something in the Rebbe's, uh, in, in the connection. But, but, but pale mamish, you're not going to print on a, a day that's not chavches la'emer, that's chavches la'emer. Or like the Rebbe told us many times, 
that if the Rebbe, for example, would say, Bresh is Bara Havayas or Shema Mesa'aris. We wouldn't print it that way. The Rebbe would be furious if we did that. Now, the Rebbe may want to be medayik that there's sometimes there's the Gili Havaya, but that's a Havana thing. You're not going to print a posseg that doesn't say the posseg. This was, this was basic rules of the game. So the Rebbe said a Maimar Chazal in a Loshan, not exactly, he would want us to write it like the Maimar Chazal, and if we didn't, we got a real chilek. Like, how, how could you, what are you writing, new Maimar Chazal? Now, sometimes we would ask the Rebbe that he said the Maimar Chazal different, and the Rebbe would talk, explain why he said it differently. So that's different. Then we'd bring the Maimar Chazal and then explain a diuk in that Maimar Chazal. But it had to have explanation. You couldn't just... These were regular klolim. That's why, look at Nasiche. What's the first thing you see? Maram Ekemis. Everything has a Maram Okim. The Rebbe was, was furious when we missed Breshis Aleph Aleph. Now, who doesn't know the source for Breshis Bar Alekim? We didn't write Breshis Aleph. Breshis Mem Aleph. The Rebbe yelled, As a fell Breshis Aleph Aleph. The Breshis from Alts is Aleph Aleph. As a Breshis Bar Alekim. So, besides the Maram Okim, it has a message. But the Rebbe was very, very adamant if a Maram Okim was missing or, you know, and, or it was written the wrong way. That was clear. I mean, that I knew from, I didn't need experience to that. That was pretty obvious. You have to write it the way it is. Either Rebbe spoke, he spoke. Sometimes, you know, you, like anytime you speak something, you speak the Indian. You don't always say, Zelashene. Sometimes you say, Zelashene. So we, this was a big diuk. Other examples, that's the Chosedim. And there are some Chosedim that I would say should not be published ever. I wrote everything because I felt I should write everything. I don't know why I did. But there are things that Rebbe said should be burned. There are things from Tavshin Chof, uh, when, what Maimer was it in Chof, uh, about the, the Anshei Chayel, the Hoven Indian, the Kichas Anshei Chayel, the Rebbe then chazed the Maimer of the Mitla Rebbe and then said that should be burned. They should erase the Maimer. So I remember they had a whole shock of time. I heard what to do. So someone said, burn them all except one or something. I don't remember what they did. Uh, they found some kunz. But there it was because I think there was a lush in there that was without a mocker. I'm not sure. I think, the, I'm not sure. I never got to the bottom. I'm sure there's an artist about it. There are tzichis that the Rebbe made very clear that should be completely uh, eliminated. So I think there are tzichis that maybe have no record. I wrote everything. I wrote Pinchas Mem Hay. But that was clear not to be printed. Pinchas Mem was about the Svarim. You know, the famous at the end of the Fabreng around Can seven o'clock. Not officially, it's not in Hanoch, it's a shmota. People have it. But that is very, very sharp sicha. It was very clear it's not for printing. Um, that was obvious. It took me actually more time to write that than the whole The Fabreng and then went until 8.10 in the evening. Started at 1.30. Pinchas Memhei. Yeah. The Rebbe, 7 o'clock approximately. The Rebbe then, everything changed. This is after Tesvav Tamas? This is the Shabbos. Yeah, this is Pin, Tesvav Tamas is Memhe. This is Pinchas Memhe. Oh, it's, uh, yeah, that Kufa. So a few, right weeks a few weeks later, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pinchas Memhe. Bolog the Rebbe also spoke, but Pinchas was a good hour and ten minutes. Yeah, you probably know. I mean, I wrote up, it was very hard to write that Sikh because the Sikh is not a, it's very emotional. And a lot of unbelievable things that Rebbe said there that are mind-blowing. Is it structured? Not re I mean, overall, yes, but not, not I, it took very long for me to write. Very hard. It took me two weeks to write it. I mean, I wrote the whole Fabreng, and then I wrote that later. It took me a long time. I, no, I also had to describe the Rebbe moved his whole, his whole demeanor changed. The Rebbe was facing, not to Mizrach, but to Maidiv. He spoke with his hands on top of the table. Um, he turned, it was very, and the Rebbe was, I remember banging his head. The whole shul could hear. That's how loud he was banging his head. I remember the Rebbe was banging his head like that and banged on the table. It was very, very hard to, to, to watch. Extremely, extremely emotional. There are things that Rebbe said there. But that's, that's printed. I wrote it all. It was really the reason not to publish it was, first of all, it wasn't the tale of Harabi, it was Upsala Sikh, you're going to learn. You know, it was completely personal and about, very much about the whole Agnes Nefesh. So the Rebbe said then, I remember. I mean, there's so many lines, but this, the, the thing that struck me was, he said, I don't know who the Rebbe was referring to. Some said Chaim Lieberman, some said someone else, I don't know. The Rebbe said, 
Und er sagt mir, als ich so nicht zu spähen, reden wegen dem. Der Rebbe schon hat die Chutzpah zu sprechen über das in diesem Subjekt. Ich weiß nicht. Ich weiß nicht. Ich weiß nicht. And, and the Rebbe then, I remember, the Rebbe took his hand and said like this, he did like this. Er hebt nicht an zu verstehen, wer ich bin. He doesn't begin to understand who I am. He thinks he's going to tell me what I should speak, what I shouldn't speak. If I think I should speak about it, I'm going to speak about it. And if I think I shouldn't, I won't. And then the Rebbe said, Wann weiß ich was zu reden? And how do I know what to speak about? And this is the Rebbe's words. He said, Ich guck in Shulchan Aruch, und le daiti versteh ich, was steht in Shulchan Aruch. That's what the Rebbe said. You're not going to hear such words every day. Und ich fort zum Oil. That's what the Rebbe said. That's how he knows what to speak about. Ich guck in Shulchan Aruch, und le daiti versteh ich, was steht in Shulchan Aruch, und ich fort zum Oil. I remember that the Rebbe should say that. You know, we know it maybe, but he should actually say it. That was one thing. The second thing that just, I mean, there's a lot that was the Rebbe said, but that was very like, revealing. <laughs> the other thing that Rebbe said was, he said, um mir me find. Again, I don't know who, what. That he, that he doesn't, that he, that he hates me. And the Rebbe said, aber etwas stimmt da nicht. So it doesn't fit. Was steht, apostle, kemayim aponim leponim, kein leva adam lada. Und ich hab nicht kein feind sein. So if help mir feind, I should have, should be, Leva Adam Lada. So you have to. It's it's. What do you mean printed? It's a, it's it's a shmata. There's a shmata of it. It's, it. You could find it. What do you mean printed? It's not printed officially. It's around. It's what's called a bootleg copy. It exists. Yeah. The, what I'm saying is not the. It's. It, it's yeah. Anyway, so the Rebbe said. This is the interesting thing the Rebbe said. So the Rebbe said is other. Sinishtemes, as I help me find. In other words, they're just saying things. Other, and the Rebbe says, but I will not say this way to the other. So, I understood, the Avusta Klal, you know, it says, Ein Odem Me is Pono Vifnei Bal And we say, one second, we see people do. So they say, because he's not an Odom. So it says, Kamayim Apon Leva Odom La Odom. So the Rebbe didn't want to say the second half. That maybe we're not talking about an Odom. That's my, that was my, Yes, Lehmer. I don't know. Maybe wrong. I'm not going to say it with Achrais. I don't know. The Rebbe didn't. Uh, there were things. This was like, I remember that. It was, I felt an Achrais to write it simply because I was a witness. And I said, I don't know. You know, let me write it. Keep it. Mem hey. Keep it undercover. It got out. It got out. It's not. Look, if someone sees it in the public today, it's not like going to be some controversial. You know, it's not like. There's nothing there that is embarrassing. It's just very personal. And I knew the Rebbe's clolim. The Rebbe didn't want Sikhs going out. That I, so like, the Rebbe would say, what's the tale? Is? Who's, who's, who, why are they re They're reading it for sensational purposes. Let's be honest. That's the truth. You know, you're learning. I mean, if you see a Chsidish that's look, look in the Sikh and they're taking Hiros and Avedis Hashem, no. But that's not necessarily always the case. I mean, frankly, we all know sensationalism uh, is attractive. <laughs> Yeah, sure, that famous Sikha, the Rebbe crying. Yeah, that was a big one. Are we on, are we on target? Some Chastere Mem Zayin, okay. Well, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I just want to tell you for the record, I mean, you know, I was a an adult witness to all of this. Sometimes I hear how some of these things are hazard. They become, the, people add a dramatic uh, flourishes that are loved after exactly, Ezga Halton. Um, and I try to be very, very precise because it's credibility. For me, if something is said that's not so it is, then it quite puts in question everything you say. You know, so I always tell people who are exaggerating or for dramatic effect that it's it maybe you may get a lot of uh, hits and attention right now and, like, you know, get people, oh, wow. But uh, at the end of the day, long term, it's not accurate. So this the Simchas Tere Mem Zayin. I've heard of people, you know, Chazer versions of it, and uh, I'll tell you exactly what I saw and heard. And I had the schus to write the Hanocha. You could check it out. The Hanocha is, I think, quite well done. I try to come capture the the sentences, the Rebbe's words. Remember, the Sikh is also printed now. Look at the Sikhs. but there I don't want to use the word drier. It's definitely more academic. It doesn't have the whole emotions. So basically. 
as you know, Simchas Teda was always a very, very, I mentioned before, very, it was the Rebbe's personal Fabreng. It was the, first, it was the only Fabreng in the Rebbe was Machadish. None of the Rabbeim Fabreng before Hakofis. Um, they have, you know, you have this, the Rebbe Rashab spoke a few times, but the Fabreng before Leil Hakofis was, we saw it as like the Rebbe's Ushpiz, Simchas Teda. Anyway, it was always Biurim and Atare, so I always talk about Atzmus, all the deepest sikhs and Atzmus and Pchira, there's a lot of them in, that, in that, those Fabrengans. The Rebbe would go through the Psukim. But what was unique, Memzayan, the Rebbe said that uh, since he speaks on a Rashi every Shabbos, there's only one Rashi he never has a chance to speak about, which is Pasha Brocha, because it's never Shabbos. Simchas Teda is always uh, when you read it. Even when Simchas Teda is Friday, you read it on Friday. Breshis is read on Shabbos. So the Rebbe says, since it's Simchas Teda, we're going to talk on the Rashi. And he chose the last Rashi, Yeshekech Echor Sheshevarto, on the Enei Kol Yisrael. And I'm not going to go through the whole Sikha, but Bikitsa the Rebbe asked a whole bunch of questions. Why would Rashi be Messiah, the whole Teda, with a negative Shvidus Aluchas? And what's Yeshekech? Remember the Rebbe said, Mefast. It's the Enei from the Tzemes. Chamisha Dvorim, the worst things that happen to the Jewish people is Shvidus Aluchas. And Shekech Echor Sheshevarto. And that's what we have to remember, Mesha, that he broke the luchas, le'enei kol Yisrael. I mean, there are a bunch of questions like that. And, you know, I could see that I was very, very kocht in it. He asked the questions, and then, or then, the Rebbe started answering. And this was Simchas Teda. Remember, Simchas Teda is also very, you know, very upbeat. Uh, it's a Simchas Teda of the Welt. And the Rebbe, right from the beginning, you could see he was very emotional. And he started speaking and saying, "What is a Rebbe?" I remember he said, "Amish uh, Rabbeinu, that the Rashi is bothered. The Ine Kol Yisrael means something has to be the highest thing. The Eses Chol Eses Chol Amefsim, Al Yitzis Mitzrayim, Kriyas Yamsuf Matan Teira." Okay, Moshe is Moshe, so it's great things that he did. But is that the greatest? And Moshe Rashi is looking, what would be the ultimate? Greatness of a Nasi. That's what he's bothered by. So the greatest thing he did of all was not the Giluyim that he did, that he broke the Luchas. And why did he break the Luchas? Like Rashi says in Pasha Kisisa, it was like the Ksuba. It was the Kriya Saksuba. He, he, he tore up the Ksuba. This way he can come back to Hashem and say, yeah, they heard like Yilacha Lakim Acherim. They built a Chet Eagle, but they never signed, basically. They never received the Shtar. They never received the Luchas. So by breaking the luchas, he essentially was preparing his defense for the Eden. The Rebbe said, "Dos is anosi," and the Rebbe started crying at this point. I, I mean, I, I, in the Hanukkah, I wrote, I wrote every place where I felt the Rebbe. Was, where I remember the Rebbe was crying and how he cried. Some places were un- uncontrollable. Imamish couldn't even hear the Rebbe's words. And thus is anosi. I remember he said, "As mesa nefesh, nishna zayn guf, zayn neshama, because it's a teira." Luchis, it's a luchis, luchis is shenis. You know, even a safer teda falls, God forbid, by mistake, we know what kind of uh, big thing. And this is not just a safer teda, it's a luchis, and not by mistake, it's deliberate. I remember that I was saying, this is a teda, a teda is Hashem. And that's what he breaks. So because the misses, because Eden are more important than anything. And he was going to show the Ebershter that you cannot destroy the Eden. That was the Eden Kol Yisrael. That was the, the gist of it. It's hard for me to capture. I mean, I have to hazard it with the Gansa Chazara. But the Rebbe was, oh, I remember, was crying, and it was very, and it was, again, it was the whole mood. Um, it was quite noisy, by the way. <laughs> A lot of people never even heard the Sikha properly, but I heard it very clearly. And it was very, it was very, very prominent, and uh, it was unbelievable. It was uh, one of the moments where the Rebbe was bombers talking about a Nasi. And, you know, when you, when you hear the Sikha, the whole Rashi comes alive. What means Yeshakech? Why would it be Yeshakech? What kind of Yeshakech? Sheshevarta. <laughs> because I'm Yeshakech, that you basically, the power of Yom Kippur, the, that the Eden survive everything, are greater than everything, that Yisrael called Mulatera, that idea, and that Anossi, Anossi understands that. The Ibrish himself would have said, destroy the Eden. They, they were sinned, and that's it. But the Nossi is Mesa Nefesh. Remember, Mecheni no Mesiflacha. Mecheni no Mesiflacha, they never said. Sefracha, Sefer Achaim. Who gives up a Sefer Achaim? It's like his Elam Haza, his Elam Habo. Again, I remember all the Lashanis now. It brings back 
you know, I have to think about it more. But I, when I wrote that Nocha, I worked very hard on that because I wanted, I knew this is like historical. I wanted the people who weren't there to try as best as possible to capture the moment. It, I mean, I, again, I, I, I'm on a gay bit of it, but and a lot of people who read it told me they, that it was those that were there, they felt it captured to some extent. Because it's not, it was more than just, again, it's not just a Rashi Sikha, Takasha, and a Teretz. There's a, that whole. I once asked Rabiel, by the way, I said, why in all the Lukut Sikhas you don't see any of the Rebbe's emotions? You don't know, you would never know what a Fabring was like from a Sikha. From Chelik Aleph through Chelik Lama, through Chelik, uh, what is it, Mem, what is it now, Mem? Lama Test. You don't see it at all. So I understand it's it's only an excerpt and it's only the, but like, I, I, I said to him a few times, if I was around Tov Shechai, you know, the sikh of, of, of Shmini Tov Shechai about Shlichas, there's unbelievable sikhas that I would have for sure submitted for Hago. I mean, I was, I was actually, I, no, I, I was very, me and Yabiel, I sat with him like this for years. So we had a very good relationship. We had some, I mean, the people, I was very close with him. And even even when we had disagreement, it was not a personal thing. He respected me. He didn't respect many people. He did respect me, but he respected me because I disagreed with him at times. I wasn't a, a pushover, and sometimes he didn't like that either. <laughs> fine, so be it. It's fine. You know, I once told him, I said, some Talmudim of yours have matured. You know, you should be proud. We've become adults. You know, G'diyim Nasset Yashim. It should be, you know, Salhevu Salem Eila. That's the ultimate of a Talmud, no? It should become. Anyway, I, I mean, till this day, that. I, I, so, no, I asked him Bekavone, because, uh, yeah, you know, Rabiel, I have, as I said, tremendous derechet. I learned a lot from him. Um, I didn't learn emotional intelligence from him, let's put it that way. But intellectual why intelligence, yes. Because he did it, because he wrote those sikhs. And I wanted, but, and, and it's not he doesn't have a hergish. Anyone knows Rabiel Fabreng beautifully? Tremendous hergish. Nigina, Chusha Nigina. He wasn't just a maskil. But for some reason, when it came to writing, everything was translated to much more academic language. But personally, you ever, speak, right, you ever sit with Fab, uh, Rabiel Fabreng? He was extremely a Baal hergish. He was a big Baal hergish. But I think it was more, the regish was more him. It was not what he taught. It wasn't his uh, persona as a teacher. It was a mashpia. So be it. I mean, everybody has their thing. Um, but, but it did always bother me. Because, so then I realized, listen, the Kutah reflects one facet of the Rebbe. In a Hanami. You go only the Kutah you'll never know what a Fabrenga looked like. No way. The Sikhs don't even end with always a bracha about a Gulliv. They could just end and that's it. I'm not, I'm not saying, listen, the Rebbe's Magiyat, and it's definitely it's the Rebbe's Teira, but it's like a, a piece of, like a, like a Hadron. Okay, so we're talking about a Ram. I understand that. I, I mean, look, at the end of the day, we do have that nochus, and you could, you could, you could get, if you want the sikha, simchas terem em zayin, the likut, as muge, as muge, it's correct, and everything there is bediuk, but you're not going to get the, the, the regish of it. No way. I mean, I know, I'm sure, I, I'm a big believer that even muge dik, my modem or sikhas, it's, it's, l'shleim asenian, it's kedai to look at the hanochas before it was muge. I know some people don't hold that. Rabiel didn't hold from that. I, I disagree adamantly with that. Why not? The Rebbe spoke it this way. We're not suggesting that the Bilti Mug is more authoritative than the Mug. No. But if you want certain, I mean, I know when I look, learn a Sikha that's Mug, I go back, even ones that I prepared, I go back many times to the Anoche Bilti Mug, sometimes a nuance, sometimes a focus, the way the Rebbe told a story. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't see any issue with that at all. I don't believe in the, again, authoritative. Obviously, what the Rebbe's Magi is the one that's most correct. And a built muga could have mistakes and so on. But if you want the regesh, you have to go back there. Just like listening to a tape. What's wrong, what's wrong with listening to a fabrengen, even if it's printed and muga? You hear the Rebbe's voice, you hear a nigan, you hear the Rebbe's, you know, emotions. A lot of that is not captured in a, in a printed version. Sometimes if you go to the Sikhs Kedesh and you look, it will, it will say... This part was Yatsala Arabic Kunsubifne Atsma and it's Muga. So in other words the Bilti Muga is not accessible to us. Um well first of all, even there there's probably Hanochis that just uh, didn't make it to that book. Uh so it probably exists. Um 
I, if, if it was up to me, if I had the Anoche, I would publish the Anoche and write. But, but that, I, I'd write, I'd write by the beginning of the Anoche that Zich Sich Zu Hu Gai Dei Harebe Ad Ve Kveid Vusa Mushli To Venit Vas Here and Here And it's clear that this is built in Muga I, I don't see any issue with that Look, look You didn't do that There are some times you didn't do that Maybe because we were lazy, to be honest Maybe we, we didn't have the time to do it I don't even remember why You still have a bunch of Anoches I see no problem Right now everyone's Koch is a Bos Ligani See how many Anoches now they have of the Maimed Bos Ligani Chav Gimel Mm Gimel. So there's uh, the Rabiel's original Hanoch. <laughs> then there's Rabiel with additions from Nachum uh, Shapiro and Lebel Then there's uh, the Lahak version. And you start comparing. Then there's the tape. And then there's different. <laughs> so there's I'll tell you the truth. I'm teaching it. I'm actually in the middle of teaching it myself. And I look at all of it. The best is obviously listening to the Fabreng, the, 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 the Maimer, as the Rebbe says it. Then I look. I look, I look at all the. Well, I'm going to do, I started with Hagdom, I'm going to do tomorrow, I'm teaching the Kail, I'm going to do first Perik Gimel, then I'll do Chav Gimel, and then Mem Gimel. The right order. I, I see them as a flow. That if you read them in that order, you actually get the best out of it. But you can't really understand Chav Gimel if you don't understand the Perik Gimel. People think you can just jump. No, you have to, you know, Chav Gimel is a beard. And so um, so I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm looking at that all. I looked at, just today, I was looking at the Lahag version versus Abiel's original. So yes, bezeh mashem bezeh. Lahag did do certain things are a little more spelled out, but Rabiel's is a little more bediuk in certain places. So I go back to the tape. I go back to the tape, and I see the tape. Yeah, you know, it. It. it I know. I, I'm. I'm. A, I'm a maniach myself. So I could see why someone would have. You know, because they're they're working with the same original, but sometimes that ever didn't spell something out. I'll give you an example. That in, in the Pedikid Gimel it says. So I pointed out in all these groups, what does that mean? Where do you see such a law? It's Lifniatsilis. And when you look at the Maimon Tafresh Pei, which is the Sod of Boslagani, it says Lifniatsilis. So everybody's commenting and commenting and commenting. So I went to the Chav Gimel Maimon, and Taka the Rebbe never says Lifniatsimtsum. He says Elimus Ainsof, and actually he compares it to Ak, which is Lach Natsimtsum. The Rebbe. So it's almost a taz de muchach in Yud Perikid Gimel because everything seems to, that it, you know, we don't have expression. It says, Ein misinus mokum le elimus klal, lifnat simtsum. So it means elimus. So there is atzilus, the klolus, lifnat sim. Anyway, you could push it, but so I, no one's going to take a chrais because it's not from a ksaviat kedish, postlegani. It's from a hamaitic. So it could be an error. But here's an example. So then we, I looked in the Lahaka Noche, they wrote, Elim Mesa Lifnat Simpson. But the Rebbe didn't say that. They just copied what it says in Perikid Gimel. Yale did not, because the Rebbe never said it. And he chapped, so he didn't add that. But they didn't realize, they just wrote from Perikid Gimel. So that's a small. Yeah, but the Rebbe in Chov Gimel never said that lotion. He says, Elim Mesa He never says, Lifnat Simpson. But they wrote it because they didn't, you know, they didn't necessarily think. Rabiel didn't. So I would, I would defer to Rabiel here because the Rebbe didn't say If the Rebbe has said it, Chav Gimel, then you go with the Rebbe. But you don't, why do you have to add it if the Rebbe didn't say it? I mean, I'm not criticizing. They probably didn't chab. Listen, it's a human being after all. On the other hand, there are pieces that they wrote out that make things a little more understandable. You know, it's... it's uh, huh? No, but these things like this is elimus so Is this fundamental? Depends. If you're a real medayik and this is fundamental. Is it fundamental? For the, I haven't seen anything I would say is too different uh, havana in the Maimer. No, I don't think it's that extent. Like that, At the end of the day, it's more lingua, it's more language and context. Okay, I mean, so we need to do a formal end to this uh, program, sure, and sure. then you can uh, continue Absolutely. answering uh, individuals. So. Uh, to all of you heroes who managed to stay till now, kalakavod to you. And it just goes to show how, how much we care, Rabbi Jacobson, about this subject matter. And we appreciate the fact that you came. And absolutely, we have a recording, so we know what you said today. And we're going to start preparing for uh, round two. We're going to do our homework, and we're going to start preparing. For As you see, two. I love talking about this. I think, it's a, I think it's a necessity in our generation. People should see what really happened. You know, basically, everything of the Rebbe is the Rebbe's Teda. And to know how that tater came into print, 
you know, a lot of there's a lot of mis, mis, mis also a lot of uh, myths and 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 falsities that go around it. People think that it was hands off or something. You could see the Haggos were very intense, and it's it's important to know how authoritative it is. And though yes, it's true we wrote the Hanochas, but the Rebbe was Magia, and the things not, you know, obviously things that are not Mugia are always subject to questions, and uh, the Rebbe wanted <coughs> questions. So you know, so so I think it's, a, it's I'm very happy we're doing this, and we'll, I'm happy to do more of it. And maybe some of the people still here, if they can get a closer look at some of the materials, if sure, possible. Sure, okay. Sure. Okay.